This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Chapter 10. I spent the following day roaming through the valley. I stood beside the sources of the Arviron, which take their rise in a glacier that with slow pace is advancing down from the summit of the hills to barricade the valley. The abrupt sides of vast mountains were before me. The icy wall of the glacier overhung me. A few shattered pines were scattered around, and the solemn silence of this glorious presence chamber of imperial nature was broken only by the brawling waves or the fall of some vast fragment, the thunder sound of the avalanche, or the cracking reverberated along the mountains of the accumulated ice, which, through the silent working of immutable laws, was ever and anon rent and torn, as if it had been but a plaything in their hands. These sublime and magnificent scenes afforded me the greatest consolation that I was capable of receiving. They elevated me from all littleness of feeling, and although they did not remove my grief, they subdued and tranquilized it. In some degree, also, they diverted my mind from the thoughts over which it had brooded for the last month. I retired to rest at night, my slumbers, as it were, waited on and ministered to by the assemblance of grand shapes which I had contemplated during the day. They congregated round me, the unstained snowy mountain top, the glittering pinnacle, the pine woods, and ragged bare ravine, the eagle soaring amidst the clouds, they all gathered round me and bade me be at peace. Where had they fled when the next morning I awoke? All of soul and spiriting fled with sleep, and dark melancholy clouded every thought. The rain was pouring in torrents, and thick mists hid the summits of the mountains, so that I even saw not the faces of those mighty friends. Still I would penetrate their misty veil, and seek them in their cloudy retreats. What were rain and storm to me? My mule was brought to the door, and I resolved to ascend to the summit of Montanvert. I remembered the effect that the view of the tremendous and ever-moving glacier had produced upon my mind when I first saw it. It had then filled me with a sublime ecstasy that gave wings to the soul and allowed it to soar from the obscure world to light and joy. The sight of the awful and majestic in nature had indeed always the effect of solemnizing my mind and causing me to forget the passing cares of life. I determined to go without a guide, for I was well acquainted with the path, and the presence of another would destroy the solitary grandeur of the scene. The ascent is precipitous, but the path is cut into continual and short windings which enable you to surmount the perpendicularity of the mountain. It is a scene terrifically desolate. In a thousand spots the traces of the winter avalanche may be perceived, where trees lie broken and strewed on the ground, some entirely destroyed, others bent, leaning upon the jutting rocks of the mountain or transversely upon other trees. The path, as you ascend higher, is intersected by ravines of snow, down which stones continually roll from above. One of them is particularly dangerous, as the slightest sound, such as even speaking in a loud voice, produces a concussion of air sufficient to draw destruction upon the head of the speaker. The pines are not tall or luxuriant, but they are somber and add an air of severity to the scene. I looked on the valley beneath, Vast mists were rising from the rivers which ran through it and curling in thick wreaths around the opposite mountains, whose summits were hid in the uniform clouds, while rain poured from the dark sky and added to the melancholy impression I received from the objects around me. Alas! Why does man boast of sensibility superior to those apparent in the brute? It only renders them more necessary beings. If our impulses were confined to hunger, thirst, and desire, we might be nearly free. But now we are moved by every wind that blows, and a chance word or scene that that word may convey to us. We rest, a dream has power to poison sleep. We rise, one wandering thought pollutes the day. 
We feel, conceive, or reason, laugh or weep, embrace fond woe, or cast our cares away. It is the same, for be it joy or sorrow, the path of its departure still is free. Man's yesterday may ne'er be like his morrow, naught may endure but mutability. It was nearly noon when I arrived at the top of the ascent. For some time I sat upon the rock that overlooks the sea of ice. A mist covered both that and the surrounding mountains. Presently a breeze dissipated the cloud, and I descended upon the glacier. The surface is very uneven, rising like the waves of a troubled sea, descending low, and interspersed by rifts that sink deep. The field of ice is almost a league in width, but I spent nearly two hours in crossing it. The opposite mountain is a bare perpendicular rock. From the side where I now stood, Montanvert was exactly opposite, at the distance of a league, and above it rose Mont Blanc in awful majesty. I remained in a recess of the rock, gazing on this wonderful and stupendous scene. The sea, or rather the vast river of ice, wound among its dependent mountains, whose aerial summits hung over its recesses. Their icy and glittering peaks shone in the sunlight over the clouds. My heart, which was before sorrowful, now swelled with something like joy. I exclaimed, Wandering spirits, if indeed ye wander, and do not rest in your narrow beds, allow me this faint happiness, or take me, as your companion, away from the joys of life. As I said this, I suddenly beheld the figure of a man, at some distance, advancing towards me with superhuman speed. He bounded over the crevices in the ice among which I had walked with caution. His stature also, as he approached, seemed to exceed that of man. I was troubled. A mist came over my eyes, and I felt a faintness seize me, but I was quickly restored by the cold gale of the mountains. I perceived, as the shape came nearer, sight tremendous and abhorred, that it was the wretch whom I had created. I trembled with rage and horror, resolving to wait his approach and then close with him in mortal combat. He approached, his countenance bespoke bitter anguish, combined with disdain and malignity, while its unearthly ugliness rendered it almost too horrible for human eyes. But I scarcely observed this. Rage and hatred had at first deprived me of utterance, and I recovered only to overwhelm him with words expressive of furious detestation and contempt. Devil! I exclaimed. Do you dare approach me? And do not you fear the fierce vengeance of my arm wreaked on your miserable head? Be gone, vile insect, or rather, stay, that I may trample you to dust. And oh, that I could, with the extinction of your miserable existence, restore those victims whom you have so diabolically murdered. I expected this reception, said the demon. All men hate the wretched. How then must I be hated, who am miserable beyond all living things? Yet you, my creator, detest and spurn me, thy creature, to whom thou art bound by ties only dissoluble by the annihilation of one of us. You purpose to kill me. How dare you sport thus with life? Do your duty towards me, and I will do mine towards you and the rest of mankind. If you will comply with my conditions, I will leave them and you at peace. But if you refuse, I will glut the maw of death until it be satiated with the blood of your remaining friends. Abhorred monster, fiend that thou art! The tortures of hell are too mild a vengeance for thy crimes. Wretched devil, you reproach me with your creation. Come on, then, that I may extinguish the spark which I so negligently bestowed. My rage was without bounds. I sprang on him, impelled by all the feelings which can arm one being against the existence of another. He easily eluded me and said, Be calm. I entreat you to hear me before you give vent to your hatred on my devoted head. Have I not suffered enough that you seek to increase my misery? Life, although it may only be an accumulation of anguish, is dear to me, and I will defend it. Remember, thou hast made me more powerful than thyself. My height is superior to thine, my joints more supple. 
but I will not be tempted to set myself in opposition to thee. I am thy creature, and I will be even mild and docile to my natural lord and king, if thou wilt also perform thy part, the which thou owest me. O oh, Frankenstein, be not equitable to every other, and trample upon me alone, to whom thy justice and even thy clemency and affection is most due. Remember that I am thy creature. I ought to be thy Adam, but I am rather the fallen angel, whom thou drivest from joy for no misdeed. Everywhere I see bliss, from which I alone am irrevocably excluded. I was benevolent and good. Misery made me a fiend. Make me happy, and I shall again be virtuous. Be gone. I will not hear you. There can be no community between you and me. We are enemies. Be gone, or let us try our strength in a fight in which one must fall. How can I move thee? Will no entreaties cause thee to turn a favorable eye upon thy creature, who implores thy goodness and compassion? Believe me, Frankenstein, I was benevolent. My soul glowed with love and humanity. But am I not alone, miserably alone? You, my creator, abhor me. What hope can I gather from your fellow creatures who owe me nothing? They spurn and hate me. The desert mountains and dreary glaciers are my refuge. I have wandered here many days. The caves of ice, which I only do not fear, are a dwelling to me, and the only one which man does not grudge. These bleak skies I hail, for they are kinder to me than your fellow beings. If the multitude of mankind knew of my existence, they would do as you do, and arm themselves for my destruction. Shall I not then hate them who abhor me? I will keep no terms with my enemies. I am miserable, and they shall share my wretchedness. Yet it is in your power to recompense me, and deliver them from an evil which it only remains for you to make so great that not only you and your family, but thousands of others, shall be swallowed up in the whirlwinds of its rage. Let your compassion be moved, and do not disdain me. Listen to my tale. When you have heard that, abandon or commiserate me, as you shall judge that I deserve. But hear me. The guilty are allowed by human laws, bloody as they are, to speak in their own defense before they are condemned. Listen to me, Frankenstein. You accuse me of murder, and yet you would, with a satisfied conscience, destroy your own creature. O oh, praise the eternal justice of man! Yet I ask you not to spare me. Listen to me, and then, if you can, and if you will, destroy the work of your hands. Why do you call to my remembrance, I rejoined, circumstances of which I shudder to reflect, that I have been the miserable origin and author? Cursed be the day, abhorred devil, in which you first saw light. Cursed, although I curse myself, be the hands that formed you. You have made me wretched beyond expression. You have left me no power to consider whether I am just to you or not. Be gone! Relieve me from the sight of your detested form. Thus I relieve thee, my creator, he said, and placed his hated hands before my eyes, which I flung from me with violence. Thus I take from thee a sight which you abhor. Still thou canst listen to me, and grant me thy compassion. By the virtues that I once possessed, I demand this from you. Hear my tale. It is long and strange, and the temperature of this place is not fitting to your fine sensations. Come to the hut upon the mountain. The sun is yet high in the heavens. Before it descends to hide itself behind your snowy precipices and illuminate another world, you will have heard my story and can decide. 
on you it rests, whether I quit forever the neighborhood of man, and lead a harmless life, or become the scourge of your fellow creatures and the author of your own speedy ruin. As he said this, he led the way across the ice. I followed. My heart was full, and I did not answer him, but as I proceeded, I weighed the various arguments that he had used, and determined at least to listen to his tale. I was partly urged by curiosity, and compassion confirmed my resolution. I had hitherto supposed him to be the murderer of my brother, and I eagerly sought a confirmation or denial of this opinion. For the first time, also, I felt what the duties of a creator towards his creature were, and that I ought to render him happy before I complained of his wickedness. These motives urged me to comply with his demand. We crossed the ice, therefore, and ascended the opposite rock. The air was cold, and the rain again began to descend. We entered the hut, the fiend with an air of exultation, I with a heavy heart and depressed spirits. But I consented to listen, and seating myself by the fire which my odious companion had lighted, he thus began his tale. End of chapter 10 This is a Library Vox recording. All Library Vox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on how to volunteer, please visit librarybox.blogsome.com. Recording by Karen LeBenz. Frankenstein, or the Modern Prometheus, by Mary Shelley. Chapter 11. It is with considerable difficulty that I remember the original error of my being. All the events that of that period appear confused and indistinct. A strange multiplicity of sensations seized me, and I saw, felt, heard, and smelled at the same time. And it was, indeed, a long time before I learned to distinguish between the operations of my various senses. By degrees I remember a stronger light pressed upon my nerves, so that I was obliged to shut my eyes. Darkness then came over me, and troubled me, but hardly had I felt this when, by opening my eyes, as I now suppose, the light poured in upon me again. I walked and, I believe, descended, but I presently found a great alteration in my sensations. Before, dark and opaque bodies had surrounded me, impervious to my touch or sight, but na I now found that I could wander on at liberty with no obstacles, which I could not surmount or avoid. The light became more and more oppressive to me, and the heat wearying me as I walked, I sought a place where I could receive shade. This was the forest near Ingolstadt, and here I lay by the side of a brook, resting from my fatigue until I felt tormented by hunger and thirst. This roused me from my nearly dormant state, and I ate some berries which I had found hanging on the trees or lying on the ground. I slacked my thirst at the brook, and then, lying down, was overcome by sleep. It was dark when I awoke. I felt cold also, and half frightened, as it were, instinctively, finding myself so desolate. Before I had quitted your apartment on a sensation of cold, I had covered myself with some clothes, but these were insufficient to secure me from the dews of night. I was poor, helpless, miserable wench. I knew and could distinguish nothing. But feeling pain invade me on all sides, I sat down and wept. Soon a gentle light stole over the heavens and gave me a sensation of pleasure. I stared up and beheld a radiant form rise from among the trees. The moon, I gazed with a kind of wonder. It moved slowly, but it enlightened my path, and I again went out in search of berries. I was still cold when under one of the trees I found a huge cloak, with which I covered myself and sat upon down upon the ground. No distinct ideas occupied my mind, I was confused. I felt light and hunger and thirst and darkness, innumerable sounds rang in my ears, and on all sides various scents saluted me. The only object that I could distinguish was the bright moon, and I fixed my eyes on that with pleasure. Several changes of the day and night passed, and the orb of night had greatly lessened, when I began to distinguish my sensations from each other. I gradually saw plainly the clear stream that supplied me with drink, and the trees that shaded me with their foliage. 
I was delighted when first I first discovered that a pleasant sound, which often saluted my ears, proceeded from the throats of the little winged animals who had often interpreted the light, intercepted the light from my eyes. I also began to observe with greater accuracy the forms that surrounded me, and to perceive the boundaries of the radiant roof of light which canopied me. Sometimes I tried to imitate the pleasant songs of the birds, but was unable. Sometimes I wished to express my sensations in my own mode, but the uncouth and inarticulate sounds which broke from me frightened me into silence again. The moon had disappeared from the night, and again, with a lessened form, showed itself, while I still remained in the forest. My sensations had by this time become distinct, and my mind received every day additional ideas. My eyes became accustomed to the light and to perceive objects in their right forms. I distinguished the insect from the herb, and by degrees one herb from another. I found that the sparrow uttered none but the harshest tones, whilst those of the blackbird and thrush were sweet and enticing. One day, when I was oppressed by cold, I found a fire which had been left by some wandering beggars, and was overcome with delight at the warmth I experienced from it. In my joy I thrust my hand into the live embers, but quickly drew it out again, with a cry of pain. How strange, I thought, that the same cause should produce such opposite effects. I examined the materials of the fire, and to my joy found it to be composed of wood. I quickly collected some branches, but they were wet and would not burn. I was pained at this, and sat wa still watching the operation of the fire. The wet wood, which I had placed near the heat, dried in itself become inflamed. I reflected on this, and by touching the various branches, I discovered the cause and busied myself in collecting a great quantity of wood that I might dry it and have a plentiful supply of fire. When night came on and brought sleep with it, I was in the greatest fear lest my fire should be extinguished. I covered it carefully with dry wood and leaves and placed wet branches upon it, and then, spreading my cloak, I lay on the ground and sank into sleep. It was morning when I awoke, and my first care was to visit the fire. I uncovered it, and a gentle breeze quickly fanned it into flame. I observed this also, and contrived the fan of, of branches which roused the embers when they were nearly extinguished. When night came again I found with pleasure that the fire gave light as well as heat, and that the discovery of this element was useful to me in my food, for I have found that some of the offals that the travelers had left had been roasted and tasted much more savory than the berries I gathered from the trees. I tried, therefore, to dress my food in the same manner, placing it on the live embers. I found the berries were spoiled by this operation, and the nuts and roots much improved. Food, however, became scarce, and I often spent the whole day searching in vain for a few acorns to assuage the, pain, the pangs of hunger. When I found this, I resolved to quit the place that I had hitherto inhabited, to seek for one where the few wants I experienced would be easily, more easily satisfied. In this emigration I exceedingly lamented the loss of fire, which I had obtained through accident, and knew not how to reproduce it. I gave several hours to the serious consideration of this difficulty, but I was obliged to re relinquish all supply, all attempt to supply it, and wrapping myself in my cloak, I had struck across the wood towards the setting sun. I passed three days in these rambles, and at length discovered the open country. A great fall of snow had taken place the night before, and the fields were of one uniform white. The appearance was dis disconsolate, and I found my feet chilled by the cold, damp substance that covered the ground. It was about seven in the morning, and I longed to obtain food and shelter. At length I perceived a small hut on a rising ground which had doubtlessly been built for the convenience of some shepherd. This was a new sight to me, and I examined the structure with great curiosity. Finding the door open, I entered. An old man sat in it near a fire over which he was preparing his breakfast. He turned on hearing a noise, and perceiving me, shrieked loudly, and quitting the hut, ran across the field with, a sp with the speed of, his debilitated, of which his debilitated form hardly seemed capable. His appearance different from any I had ever before seen, and his flight somewhat surprised me. But I was enchanted by the appearance of the hut. Here the snow and rain could not penetrate. The ground was dry, 
and it presented to me then as exquisite and divine a retreat as pandemonium appeared to the devil to the demons of hell after their sufferings in the lake of fire i greedily devoured the remnants of the shepherd's breakfast which consisted of bread cheese milk and wine the latter however i did not like then over become then overcome by fatigue i lay up down among some straw and fell asleep it was noon when i awoke and allured by the warmth of the sun which shone brightly on the white ground i determined to recommence my travels and thus depositing the remains of the peasant breakfast in a wallet i found i proceeded across the fields for several hours until at sunset i arrived at a village how miraculous did this appear the huts, the neater cottages, the stately houses engaged my admiration by turns. The vegetables in the garden, the milk and cheese that I saw placed at the windows of some of the cottages allured my appetite. One of the best of these I entered, but I had hardly placed my foot within the door before the children shrieked, and one of the women fainted. The whole village was roused, some fled, some attacked me, until grievously bruised by stones and other kinds of missile weapons, I escaped to the open country, and fearfully took ref refuge in a low hovel, quite bare, and making a wretched appearance after the palaces I had beheld in the village. This hovel, however, joined a cottage of neat and pleasant appearance, but after my late dearly bought experience I dared not enter it. My place of refuge was constructed of wood, but so low that I could enter it, I could with difficulty sit upright in it. No wood, however, was placed on the earth which formed the floor, but it was dry, and although the wind entered it by innumerable chinks, I found it an agreeable asylum from the snow and rain. Here, then, I retreated and lay down to have happy to have found a shelter, however miserable from the inclemency of the season, and still more from the barbarity of man. As soon as morning dawned, I crept from the can my kennel, that I might view the adjacent cottage and discover if it could remain in the habitation I had found. It was situated against the, black, the back of the cottage and surrounded on both sides, on the sides which were exposed by a pigsty and a clear pool of water. One part was open, and by that I had crept in, but now I covered every crevice by which I might be perceived with stone and wood, yet in such a manner that I might move on the occasion to pass out all the light I enjoyed came through the sty, and that was sufficient for me. Having thus arranged my dwelling and carpeting it with clean straw, I retired, for I saw the figure of a man in the distance, and I remembered too well my treatment the night before to trust myself in his power. I had first, however, provided for my sustenance for the day by a loaf of coarse bread, which I purloined, and a cup from which I drank more conveniently than from my hand of the pure water which flowed by my retreat. The floor was a little raised so that it was kept perfectly dry, and by its vicinity to the chimney of the cottage it was tolerably warm. Thus being provided, I resolved to reside in this hovel until something should occur which might alter my determination. It was indeed a paradise compa compared to the bleak forest, my former residence, and the rain dropping branches and dank earth. I ate my breakfast with pleasure, and was about to remove a plank to procure myself a little water when I heard a step, and looking through a small chink I beheld a young creature with a pail on her head passing before my hovel. The girl was young and of gentle demeanor, unlike what I have since found cottagers and farm ser house servants to be. Yet she was meanly dressed, a coarse blue petticoat and a linen jacket being her only garb. Her fair hair was plaited but not adorned. She looked patient yet sad. I had lost sight of her, and in about a quarter of an hour she returned bearing the pail which was now partially filled with milk. As she walked along, seemingly uncommon by the burden, a young man met her, whose countenance expressed a deeper despondence. Uttering a few sounds with an air of melancholy, he took the pail from her head and bore it to the cottage himself. She followed, and they disappeared. Presently I saw the young man again, with some tools in his hand, cross the field behind the cottage, and the girl was also busied, sometimes in the house, sometimes in the yard. On examining my dwelling, 
I found that one of the windows of the cottage had formerly occupied a part of it, but the panes had been filled up with wood. In one of these was a small and almost imperceptible chink through which the eye could just penetrate. Through this cre crevice a small room was visible, whitewashed and clean, but very bare of furniture. In one corner, near a small fire, sat an old man, leaning his head on his hands in a disconsolate attitude. The young girl was occupied in arranging the cottage, but presently she took something out of a drawer, which employed her hands, and she sat beside the old man, who, taking up an instrument, began to play and to produce sounds sweeter than the voice of the thrush or the nightingale. It was a lovely sight, even to me, poor wretch, who had never, be, never beheld aught be beautiful before. The silver hair and benevolent countenance of the aged cottager won my reverence, while the gentle manners of the girl enticed my love. He played a sweet, mournful air, which I perceived drew tears from the eyes of his amiable companion, of which the old man took no notice until she sobbed audibly. Then he pronounced a few sounds, and the fair creature, leaving her work, knelt at his feet. He raised her and smiled with such kindness and affection that I felt sensations of a particular and overpowering nature. They were a mixture of pain and pleasure, such as I had never before expressed, experienced, from either hunger or cold, warmth nor food, and I withdrew from the window, unable to bear these emotions. Soon after the young man returned, bearing on his shoulders a load of wood. The girl met him at the door, helped to relieve him of his burden, and taking some of the fuel into the cottage, placed it on the fire. Then she and the youth went apart into a nook of the cottage, and he showed her a large loaf and a piece of cheese. She seemed pleased and went into the garden for some roots and plants, which she placed in water, and then upon the fire. Afterward she continued her work, whilst the man, the young man went into the garden and appeared busily employed in digging and pulling up roots. After he had been employed, thus, been employed thus about an hour, the young woman joined him, and they entered the cottage together. The old man had in the meantime been pensive, but on the appearance of his companions he assumed a more cheerful air, and they sat down to eat. The meal was quickly dispatched. The young woman was again occupied in arranging the cottage, and the old man walked before the cottage in the sun for a few minutes, leaning on the arm of the youth. Nothing could exceed in beauty the contrast between these two excellent creatures. One was old with silver hairs and a countenance beaming with benevolence and love. The younger was slight and graceful in his figure, and his features were molded with the finest symmetry, yet his eyes and attitude expressed the utmost sadness and despondency. The old man returned to the cottage, and the youth, with tools different from those he had used in the morning, directed his steps across the fields. Night quickly shut in, but to my extreme wonder I found the cottagers had a means of pro prolonging light by the use of tapers, and was delighted to find it that in the setting of the sun did not put an end to the pleasure I experienced in watching my human neighbors. In the evening the young girl and her companion were employed in various occupations, which I did not understand, and the old man again took up the instrument, which produced the divine sounds that enchanted me in the morning. As soon as he had finished, the youth began not to play, but to utter sounds that were monotonous, and neither resembling the harmony of the old man's instrument, nor the songs of the birds, I since found out that he read aloud, but at that time I knew nothing of the science of words or letters. The family, after having been thus occupied for a short time, extinguished their lights and retired, as I conjectured, to rest. End of chapter 11 this is a LibraryVox recording. All LibraryVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on how to volunteer, please visit LibraryVox.blogsome.com. Recording by Karen LeBenz. Frankenstein, or the Modern Prometheus, by Mary Shelley. Chapter 12 I lay on my straw, but I could not sleep. I thought of the occurrences of the day. What chiefly struck me was the gentle manners of these people, and I longed to join them but dared not. I remembered too well the treatment I had suffered the night before from the barbarous villagers, and resolved, 
whatever course of conduct I might hereafter think it right to pursue, that for the present I would remain quietly in my hovel, watching and endeavoring to, to discover the motives which influenced their actions. The cottagers arose the next morning before the sun. The young woman arranged the cottage and prepared the food, and the youth departed after the first meal. This day was passed in the same routine as that which preceded it. The young man was constantly employed out of doors, and the girl in various laborious occupations within. The old man, whom I soon perceived to be blind, enjoyed his leisure hours on his instrument or in contemplation. Nothing could exceed the love and respect which the younger cottagers exhibited towards their venerable companion. They performed towards him every little office of attention and duty with gentleness, and he rewarded them with his benevolent smiles. They were not entirely happy. The young man and his companion often went apart and appeared to weep. I saw no cause for their unhappiness, but I was deeply affected by it. If such lovely creatures were miserable, it was less strange that I, an imperfect and solitary being, should be wretched. Yet why were these gentle beings unhappy? They possessed a delightful, ho a delightful house, for which it was in my eyes, and every luxury. They had a fire to warm them, when chill and delicious viands when hungry. They were dressed in excellent clothes, and still more, they enjoyed one another's company and speech, interchanging each day looks of affection and kindness. What did their tears imply? Did they really express pain? I was, una I was at first unable to solve these questions, but perpetual attention and time explained to me many appearances were f which were first enigmatic. A considerable period elapsed before I discovered one of the causes of the uneasiness of this amenable family. It was poverty, and they suffered that evil in a very distressing degree. Their nourishment consisted entirely of the vegetables of their garden and the milk of one cow, which gave very little during the winter, when its masters could scarcely procure food to support it. They often, I believe, suffered the pangs of hunger very poignantly, especially the two younger cottagers for several times they placed food before the old man when they reserved none for themselves. This trait of kindness moved me sensibly. I had been accustomed during the night to steal a part of their store for my own consumption, but when I found, my, when I found that in doing this I inflicted pain on the cottagers, I abstained and satisfied myself with berries, nuts, and roots, which I gathered from a neighboring wood. I also discovered another means through which I was enabled to insist their labors. I found that the youth spent a great deal, a great part of each day, in collecting wood for the family fire, and during the night I often used, took his tools, the use of which I quickly discovered, and brought home firing sufficient for the com consumption of several days. I remember the first time I did this. The young woman, when she opened the door in the morning, appeared greatly astonished on seeing such a great pile of wood on the outside. She uttered some words in a loud voice, and the youth joined her, who also expressed surprise. I observed with pleasure that he did not go into the forest that day, but spent it in repairing the cottage and cultivating the garden. By degrees I made a discovery of still greater moment. I found that these people possessed a method of communicating their experience and feelings to one another by articulate sounds. I perceived that the words they spoke sometimes produced pleasure or pain, smiles or sadness, in the minds and countenances of the hearers. This was indeed a godlike science, and I ardently desired to become acquainted with it. But I was baffled in every attempt I made for this purpose. Their pronunciation was quick, and the words they uttered, not having any p apparent connection with visible objects, I was unable to discover any clue by which I could unravel the mystery of their reference. By great application, however, and after having remained during the space of several revolutions of the moon in my hovel, I discovered the names that were given to some of the most familiar objects of discourse. I learned and applied the words fire, milk, bread, and wood. I learned the names of the cottagers themselves. The youth and his companion had each of sev them several names. But the old man had only one, which was father. The girl was called sister, or Agatha, and the youth Felix, brother, or son. 
I cannot describe the delight I felt when I learned the ideas appropriated to each of these sounds and was able to pronounce them. I distinguished several other goods without being words without being able as yet to understand or apply them, such as good, dearest, unhappy. I spent the winter in this manner. The gentle manners and beauty of the cottagers greatly endeared them to me. When they were unhappy, I felt depressed. When they rejoiced, I sympathized in their joys. I saw few bi human beings besides them, and if any other happened to enter the cottage, their harsh manners and rude gait only enhanced me to the superior accomplishments of my friends. The old man, I could perceive, often endeavored to encourage his children, as sometimes I found that he called to them to cast off their melancholy. He would talk in a cheerful accent, and the expression of goodness that bestowed pleasure upon, upon me. Agatha listened with respect, her eyes sometimes filled with tears, which she endeavored to wipe away unperceived. But I found, generally found, that her countenance was, and tone were more cheerful after having listened to the exhortations of her father. It was not thus with Felix. He was always the saddest of the group, and even to my unpracticed senses he appears to have suffered more deeply than his friends. But if his countenance was more sorrowful, his voice was more cheerful of that the, of that of his sister, especially when he addressed the old man. I could mention innumerable instances which, although slight, marked the dispositions of these admirable cottagers. In the midst of poverty and want, Felix carried pleasure with pleasure to his sister the first little white flower that peeped from out from beneath the snowy ground. Early in the morning, before she had risen, he had cleared away the snow that obstructed her path to the milk house, drew water from the well, and brought the wood from the, out, from the outhouse, where, to his perpetual astonishment, he found his store always replenished by an invisible hand. In the day, I believed, he worked sometimes for a neighboring farmer, because he often went forth and did not return until dinner, yet brought no wood with him. At other times, he worked in the garden. But as there were little, was little to do in the frosty season, he read to the old man and Agatha. This reading had puzzled me extremely at first, but by degrees I discovered that he uttered many of the same sounds when he read as when he talked. I conjectured, therefore, that he found on the paper signs for speech which he understood, and I ardently longed to comprehend these also. But how was that possible when I did not even understand the sounds for which they stood as signs? I improved, however, sensibly in this science, but not sufficiently to follow any kind of conversation, although I applied my whole mind to the endeavor, for I easily perceived, although I eagerly long, longed to, to discover myself to the cottagers, I ought not make to it the attempt until I had first become master of their language which knowledge might enable me to make them overlook the deformity of my figure. For with this also the contrast perpetually presented to my eyes had made me acquainted. I had admi admired the perfect forms of my cottagers, their grace, beauty, and the, the delicate complexions. But how I was terrified when I viewed myself in the transparent pool. At first I stared back, unable to believe that it was indeed I who reflected in the mirror, and when I became fully convinced that I was in reality the monster that I am, I was filled with the bitterest sensations of despondence and mortification. Alas, I did not yet know, entirely know, the fatal effects of this miserable deformity. As the sun became warmer and the light of the day longer, the snows vanished, and I beheld the bare trees and black earth. From this time Felix was more employed, and the heart-moving indications of impending famine disappeared. Their food, as I found, after which found, was coarse, it was, but it was wholesome, and they procured a sufficiency of it. Several new kinds of plants sprang up in the garden, which they dressed, and these signs of comfort increased daily as the season advanced. The old man, leaning on his son, walked each day at noon, when it did not rain, and I found it was called when the heavens poured forth its waters. This frequently took place, but 
a high wind quickly dried the earth, and the season became far more pleasant than it had been. My mode of life in my hovel was uniform. During the morning I attended the motions of the cottagers, and when they were dispersed in various occupations, I slept. The remainder of the day was spent in observing my friends. When they had retired to rest, if there was any moon or the night was starlight, I went to the woods and collected my own food and fuel for the cottage. When I returned as often as it was necessary, I cleared their path from the snow and performed those offices that I had seen done by Felix. I afterwards found that these laborers, performed by an invisible hand, greatly astonished them, and once or twice I heard them on these occasions utter the words, Good Spirit, Wonderful, but I did not then understand the sig signification of these terms. My thoughts now be become more active, and I longed to discover the motives and feelings of these lovely creatures. I was inquisitive to know why Felix appeared so miserable, and Agatha so sad. I thought, foolish wrench, that it might be in my power to restore happiness to these deserving people. When I slept or was absent, the forms of the venerable blind father, the gentle Agatha, and the excellent Felix flitted before me. I looked upon them as superior beings who would be the arbiters of my future destiny. I formed in my imagination a thousand pictures of presenting myself to them, and their gentle reception of me. I imagined that they would be disgusted until, by my gentle demeanor and conciliating words, I should first win their favor and afterwards their love. These thoughts exhilarated me and led me to apply with fresh ardor to the acquiring of the art of language. My organs were indeed harsh but supple, and although my voice was very unlike the soft music of their tones, yet I pronounced such words as I understood with tolerable ease. And it was as the ass and the lapdog, yet surely the gentle ass whose intentions were affectionate, although his manners were rude, deserved better treatment than blows and exc execration. The pleasant showers and gentle warmth of spring greatly altered the aspect of the earth. Men who before this change seemed to have been hid in caves dispersed themselves and were employed in various arts of cultivation. The birds sang in more cheerful tones, and the leaves began to bud forth on the trees. Happy, happy earth! Fit habitation for gods, which so short a time before was bleak, damp, and unwholesome. My spirits were elevated by the enhancing appearance of nature. The past was blotted from my memory, the present was tranquil, and the future guided by bright rays of hope and anticipations of joy. End of chapter 12. This is a Library Vox recording. All Library Vox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on how to volunteer, please visit librarybox.blogsome.com. Recording by Karen LeBenz. Frankenstein, the Modern Prometheus by Mary Shelley. Chapter 13. I now hasten to the more moving part of my story. I shall relate events that impressed me with feelings which, from what I had been, had made me what I am. Spring advanced rapidly and the weather became fine and the skies cloudless. It surprised me that what before was desert and gloomy should now bloom with the most beautiful flowers and ver verdure. My senses were gratified and refreshed by a thousand scents of delight and a thousand sights of beauty. It was on one of these days when my cottagers periodically rested from labor, the old man played on his guitar, and the children listened to him, that I observed the countenance of Felix was melancholy beyond expression. He sighed frequently and once his father paused in his music, and I conjectured, conjectured by his manner that he inquired the cause of the son's sorrow. Felix replied in a cheerful accent, and the old man was recommencing his music when someone tapped at the door. It was a lady on horseback, accompanied by a countryman as a guide. The lady was dressed in a dark suit and covered with a thick black veil. Agatha asked a question, to which the stranger only replied by pronouncing, in a sweet accent, the name of Felix. Her voice was musical, but unlike that of either of my friends. On hearing this word, Felix came up hastily to the lady, who, when she saw him, 
threw up her veil, and I beheld the countenance of angelic beauty and expression, her hair of shining raven black, and curiously braided, her eyes were dark but gentle, though animated, her, fe her features of a regular proportion, and her complexion wondrously fair, each cheek tingled with a lovely pink. Felix sometimes ravaged with delight when he saw her. Every trait of sorrow vanished from his face, and it instantly expressed a degree of ecstatic joy, of which I could hardly have believed it capable. His eyes sparkled, as his cheeks flushed with pleasure, and at that moment I thought of him as beautiful as the stranger. She appeared affected by different feelings, wiping a few tears from her lovely eyes. She held her hand out to Felix, who kissed it rapturously, and called her, as well as I could distinguish, his sweet Abrian. She did not appear to understand him, but smiled. He assisted her to dismount, and, dismissing her guide, conducted her into the cottage. Some conversation took place between him and his father, and the young stranger knelt at the old man's feet, and would have kissed his hand, but he raised her and embraced her affectionately. I soon perceived that although the stranger uttered the articulate sounds, and soon appeared to have a language of her own, she was neither understood by nor herself understood the cottagers. They made many signs which I did not comprehend, and I saw that her presence diffused gladness through the cottage, dispelling their sorrow as the sun dissipates the morning mist. Felix seemed particularly happy, and with smiles of delight welcomed his Abraham. Agatha, the ever-gentle Agatha, kissed the hands of the lovely stranger, and pointing to her brother, made signs which appeared to me to mean that he had been sorrowful until she came. Some hours passed thus, while they, by their countenances, expressed joy, the cause of which I did not comprehend. Presently I found, by the frequent recurrence of some sound, which the stranger repeated after them, that she was endeavoring to learn their language, and the idea instantly occurred to me that I should make use of the same instructions to the same end. The stranger learned about twenty words at the first lesson. Most of them, indeed, were those which I had before understood, but I profited by the others. As night came on, Agatha and the, and the Arabian retired early. When they separated, Felix kissed the hand of the stranger and said, Good night, sweet Safi. He sat up much longer, conversing with his father, and by the frequent repetition of her name, I conjectured that their lovely guest was the subject of their conversation. I ardently desired to understand them, and bent every faculty towards that purpose, but found it utterly impossible. The next morning Felix went out to his work, and after the usual occupations of Agatha were finished, the Arabian sat at the feet of the old man, and taking his guitar played some airs so entrancingly beautiful that they at once drew tears of sorrow and delight from my eyes. She sang, and her voice flowed with a rich cadence, swelling or dying like a night night like a nightingale of the woods. When she had finished, she gave the guitar to Agatha, who at first declined it. She played a simple air, and her voice accompanied it in sweet accents, but unlike the wondrous strain of the stranger. The old man appeared enraptured, and said some words with Agatha endeavored to explain to Safi, and by which she appeared to wish to express that she bestowed on him the greatest delight by her music. The days now passed as peacefully as before, with the sole alteration that, of, that joy had taken place of sadness and the countenances of my friends. Safi was always gay and happy. She and I improved rapidly in the knowledge of language, so that in two months I began to comprehend most of the words uttered by my protectors. In the meanwhile, also, the black ground was covered with herbage, and the green banks interspersed with innumerable flowers, sweet to the scent and the eyes, stars of pale radiance among the moonlit woods. The sun became warmer, the nights clear and balmy, and my nocturnal ramblers, rambles were an extreme pleasure to me, although they were considerably shortened by the late setting and early rising of the sun, for I never ventured abroad during daylight, fearful of meeting with the same treatment I had formerly endured at the first village which I entered. My days were spent in close attention that I might more speedily master the language, and that I may boast, and I may boast, that I improved more rapidly than the Arabian, who understood very little and conversed in broken accents, 
whilst I comprehended and could imitate almost every word that was spoken. While I improved in speech, I also learned the science of letters, as it was taught to the stranger, and this opened before me a wide range, a wide field for wonder and delight. The book from which Felix instructed Safi was Volney's Ruins of Empires. I should not have understood the pur purport of this book had not Felix, in reading it, gave very minute explanations. He had chosen this work, he said, because the de declamatory style was framed in imitation of the Eastern authors. Though this work I obtained a through this work, I obtained a curious knowledge of history and a view of the several empires at present existing in the world. It gave me an insight into the manners, governments, and religions of the different nations of the earth. I heard of the slothful, slothful Asiatics, of the stupendous genius and mental activity of the Grecians, of the war and wondrous virtue of the early Romans, of their subsequent de degenerating, of the decline of that mighty empire, of chivalry, Christianity, and kings. I heard of the discovery of the American Hemisphere, and wept with Safi over the hapless fate of its, of its original inhabitants. These wonderful narrations inspired me with strange feelings. Was man indeed at once so powerful, so virtuous and magnificent, yet so vicious and base? He appeared at one time the mere scion of evil, of the evil principle, and at another as all that can be conceived of noble and godlike. To be a great and virtuous man appeared the highest honor that can befall a sensitive being. To be base and vicious, as many on record have been, appeared the lowest de degradation, a condition more abject uh, that than that of the blind mole or harmless worm. For a long time I could not conceive how one man could go forth to murder his fellow, or even why there were laws and governments. But when I heard details of the vice and bloodshed, my wonder ceased, and I turned away with disgust and loathing. Every conversation of the cottagers now opened new wonders to me. While I listened to the instructor's instructions which Felix bestowed upon the Arabian, the strange system of human society was explained to me. I heard of the division of property, of immense wealth and squalid poverty, of rank, descent, and noble blood. The words introduced me to turn towards myself. I learned the, that the possessions most esteemed by your fellow creatures were high and unsullied de descent, united with riches. A man might be respected with only one of these advantages, but without either he was considered, except in very rare instances, as a vagabond and a slave, doomed to waste his powers for the profits of the chosen few. And what was I? Of my creation and creator I was absolutely ignorant, but I knew that I possessed no money, no friends, no kind of property. I was, beside, endured with a hideously figure, a figure hideously deformed and lonesome. I was not even the same nature as man. I was more agile than they and could subsist on a, upon a coarser diet. I bore the extremities of heat and cold with less injury to my frame, and my stature far exceeded theirs. When I looked around, I saw and heard of none like me. Was I, then, a monster, a blot upon the earth from which all men fled, and whom all men disowned? I cannot describe to you the agony that these reflections inflicted upon me. I tried to dispel them, but sorrow only increased with knowledge. Oh, that I had forever remained in my native wood, nor known nor felt beyond the sensations of hunger, thirst, and heat. Of what a strange nature is knowledge, it clings to the mind when it is once seized on it like a light leeching on a rock. I had sometimes wished to shake off all thought and feeling, but I learned that there was only one means to overcome the sensation of pain, and that was death, a state of which I feared yet did not understand. I admired virtue and good feelings and loved the gentle manners and admirable qualities of my cottagers, but I was shut off from the intercourse with them except through means which I obtained by stealth, when I was unseen and unknown, which rather increased than satisfied the desire I had of becoming one of my fellows. The gentle words of Agatha and the animated smiles of the charming Arabian were not for me. 
the mild exhortations of the old man, and the lively conversation of the loved Felix were not for me. Miserable, unhappy wrench. Other lessons were impressed upon me even more deeply. I heard of the differences between the sexes and the birth and growth of children, how the father doted on the smiles of the infant, and the lively, lively sallies of the older child, how all life and cares of the mother were wrapped up in precious charge, how the mind of youth expanded and gained knowledge of brother, sister, and all the various relationships which bind one human being to another in mutual bonds. But where were my friends and relations? No father had watched my infant days. No mother had blessed me with smiles or caresses. Nor if they had, all my past life was now a blot, a blind vacancy in which I distinguished nothing. From my earliest remembrance I had been as I then was in height and proportion. I had never yet seen a being resembling me, or who claimed any intercourse with me. What was I? The question returned, only to be answered with groans. I will soon explain to what those feelings tended, but allow me to return to the cottagers, whose story excited me in such various feeling of indignation, delight, and wonder but which all terminated in innocent love and reverence for my protectors. For so I loved in an innocent, half-painful self-deceit to call them. End of chapter 13 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com Today's reading by Kristen McQuillan Frankenstein by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley Chapter 14 Some time elapsed before I learned the history of my friends. It was one which could not fail to impress itself deeply on my mind, unfolding as it did in a number of circumstances, each interesting and wonderful to one so utterly inexperienced as I was. The name of the old man was de Lacy. He was descended from a good family in France, where he had lived for many years in affluence, respected by his superiors and beloved by his equals. His son was bred in the service of his country, and Agatha had ranked with ladies of the highest distinction. A few months before my arrival they had lived in a large and luxurious city called Paris, surrounded by friends and possessed of every enjoyment which virtue, refinement of intellect, or taste, accompanied by a moderate fortune, could afford. The father of Safi had been the cause of their ruin. He was a Turkish merchant, and had inhabited Paris for many years, when for some reason which I could not learn, he became obnoxious to the government. He was seized and cast into prison the very day that Safi arrived from Constantinople to join him. He was tried and condemned to death. The injustice of his sentence was very flagrant, all Paris was indignant, and it was judged that his religion and wealth, rather than the crime alleged against him, had been the cause of his condemnation. Felix had accidentally been present at the trial. His horror and indignation were uncontrollable when he heard the decision of the court. He made at that moment a solemn vow to deliver him, and then looked around for the means. After many fruitless attempts to gain admittance to the prison, he found a strongly grated window in an unguarded part of the building, which lighted the dungeon of the unfortunate Mohammedan, who, loaded with chains, waited in despair the execution of the barbarous sentence. Felix visited the grate at night, and made known to the prisoner his intentions in his favor. The Turk, amazed and delighted, endeavored to rekindle the zeal of his deliverer by promises of reward and wealth. Felix rejected his offers with contempt. Yet when he saw the lovely Safi, who was allowed to visit her father, and who by her gestures expressed her lively gratitude, the youth could not help owning to his own mind that the captive possessed a treasure which would fully reward his toil and hazard. The Turk quickly perceived the impression that his daughter had made on the heart of Felix, and endeavored to secure him more entirely in his interests by the promise of her hand in marriage so soon as he should be conveyed to a place of safety. Felix was too delicate to accept this offer, yet he looked forward to the probability of the event as to the consummation of his happiness. During the ensuing days, while the preparations were going forward for the escape of the merchant, the zeal of Felix was warmed by several letters that he received from this lovely girl, who found means to express her thoughts in the language of her lover, by the aid of an old man, a servant of her father who understood French. She thanked him in the most ardent terms for his intended services toward her parent 
and at the same time she gently deplored her own fate. I have copies of this letters, for I found means during my residence in the hovel to procure implements of writing, and the letters were often in the hands of Felix or Agatha. Before I depart, I will give them to you. They will prove the truth of my tale. But at present, as the sun is already far declined, I shall only have time to repeat the substance of them to you. Safi related that her mother was a Christian Arab, seized and made a slave by the Turks. Recommended by her beauty, she had won the heart of the father of Safi, who married her. The young girl spoke in high and enthusiastic terms of her mother, who, born in freedom, spurned the bondage to which she was now reduced. She instructed her daughter in the tenets of her religion, and taught her to aspire to higher powers of intellect and an independence of spirit forbidden to the female followers of Mohammed. This lady died, but her lessons were indelibly impressed on the mind of Safi, who sickened at the prospect of again returning to Asia and being immured within the walls of a harem, allowed only to occupy herself with infantile amusements ill-suited to the temper of her soul, now accustomed to grand ideas and a noble emulation for virtue. The prospect of marrying a Christian, and remaining in a country where women were allowed to take a rank in society, was enchanting to her. The day for the execution of the Turk was fixed but on the night previous to it he quitted his prison and before morning was distant many leagues from Paris. Felix had procured passports in the name of his father, sister, and himself. He had previously communicated his plan to the former, who aided the deceit by quitting his house under the pretense of a journey, and concealed himself with his daughter in an obscure part of Paris. Felix conducted the fugitives through France to Lyon, and across Mount Cenis to Leghorn, where the merchant had decided to wait a favorable opportunity of passing into some part of the Turkish dominions. Safi resolved to remain with her father until the moment of his departure, before which time the Turk renewed his promise that she should be united to his deliverer, and Felix remained with them in expectation of that event, and in the meantime he enjoyed the society of the Arabian, who exhibited toward him the simplest and tenderest affection. They conversed with one another through the means of an interpreter, and sometimes with the interpretation of looks, and Safi sang to him the divine airs of her native country. The Turk allowed this intimacy to take place, and encouraged the hopes of the youthful lovers, while in his heart he had formed far other plans. He loathed the idea that his daughter should be united to a Christian, but he feared the resentment of Felix if he should appear lukewarm, for he knew that he was still in the power of his deliverer if he should choose to betray him to the Italian state which they inhabited. He revolved a thousand plans by which he should be enabled to prolong the deceit until it might be no longer necessary, and secretly to take his daughter with him when he departed. His plans were facilitated by the news which arrived from Paris. The government of France were greatly enraged at the escape of their victim, and spared no pains to detect and punish his deliverer. The plot of Felix was quickly discovered, and De Lacy and Agatha were thrown into prison. The news reached Felix and roused him from his dream of pleasure. His blind and aged father and his gentle sister lay in a noisome dungeon while he enjoyed the free air and the society of her whom he loved. This idea was torture to him. He quickly arranged with the Turk that if the latter should find a favorable opportunity for escape before Felix could return to Italy, Safi should remain as a boarder at a convent in Leghorn, and then, quitting the lovely Arabian, he hastened to Paris and delivered himself up to the vengeance of the law hoping to free De Lacy and Agatha by this proceeding. He did not succeed. They remained confined for five months before the trial took place, the result of which deprived them of their fortune and condemned them to a perpetual exile from their native country. They found a miserable asylum in the cottage in Germany, where I discovered them. Felix soon learned that the treacherous Turk, for whom he and his family endured such unheard-of oppression, on discovering that his deliverer was thus reduced to poverty and ruin, became a traitor to good feeling and honor, and had quitted Italy with his daughter, insultingly sending Felix a pittance of money to aid him, as he said, in some plan of future maintenance. Such were the events that preyed on the heart of Felix, and rendered him, when I first saw him, the most miserable of his family. He could have endured poverty, and while this distress had been the meed of his virtue, he gloried in it but the ingratitude of the Turk and the loss of his beloved Safi were misfortunes more bitter and irreparable. The arrival of the Arabian now infused new life into his soul. When the news reached Leghorn that Felix was deprived of his wealth and rank, the merchant commanded his daughter to think no more of her lover but to prepare to return to her native country. 
The generous nature of Safi was outraged by this command. She attempted to expostulate with her father, but he left her angrily, reiterating his tyrannical mandate. A few days after, the Turk entered his daughter's apartment and told her hastily that he had reason to believe that his residence at Leghorn had been divulged, and he should speedily be delivered up to the French government. He had consequently hired a vessel to convey him to Constantinople, for which city he should sail in a few hours. He intended to leave his daughter under the care of a confidential servant, to follow at her leisure with the greater part of his property, which had not yet arrived at Leghorn. When alone, Safer resolved in her own mind the plan of conduct that it would become her to pursue in this emergency. A residence in Turkey was abhorrent to her. Her religion and her feelings were alike averse to it. By some papers of her father, which fell into her hands, she heard of the exile of her lover, and learnt the name of the spot where he then resided. She hesitated some time, but at length she formed her determination. Taking with her some jewels that belonged to her, and a sum of money, she quitted Italy with an attendant, a native of Leghorn, but who understood the common language of Turkey, and departed for Germany. She arrived in safety at a town about twenty leagues from the cottage of de Lacy, when her attendant fell dangerously ill. Safi nursed her with the most devoted affection, but the poor girl died, and the Arabian was left alone, unacquainted with the language of the country, and utterly ignorant of the customs of the world. She fell, however, into good hands. The Italian had mentioned the name of the spot for which they were bound, and after her death the woman of the house in which they lived took care that Safi should arrive in safety at the cottage of her lover. CHAPTER Fifteen. Such was the history of my beloved cottagers. It impressed me deeply. I learned from the views of social life which it developed to admire their virtues and to deprecate the vices of mankind. As yet I looked upon crime as a distant evil, benevolence and generosity were ever present before me, inciting within me a desire to become an actor in the busy scene where so many admirable qualities were called forth and displayed. But in giving an account of the progress of my intellect, I must not omit a circumstance which occurred in the beginning of the month of August of the same year. One night, during my accustomed visit to the neighboring woods, where I collected my own food and brought home firing for my protectors, I found on the ground a leathern portmanteau containing several articles of dress and some books. I eagerly seized the prize, and returned with it to my hovel. Fortunately, the books were written in the language, the elements of which I had acquired at the cottage. They consisted of Paradise Lost, a volume of Plutarch's Lives, and the Sorrows of Werther. The possession of these treasures gave me extreme delight. I now continually studied and exercised my mind upon these histories, whilst my friends were employed in their ordinary occupations. I can hardly describe to you the effect of these books. They produced in me an infinity of new images and feelings, that sometimes raised me to ecstasy, but more frequently sunk me into the lowest dejection. In the sorrows of Werther, besides the interest of its simple and affecting story, so many opinions are canvassed, and so many lights thrown upon what had hitherto been to me obscure subjects, that I found in it a never-ending source of speculation and astonishment. The gentle and domestic manners it described, combined with lofty sentiments and feelings, which had for their object something out of self, accorded well with my experience among my protectors, and with the wants which were forever alive in my own bosom. But I thought Werther himself was a more divine being than I had ever beheld or imagined. His character contained no pretension, but it sank deep. The disquisitions upon death and suicide were calculated to fill me with wonder. I did not pretend to enter into the merits of the case, yet I inclined towards the opinions of the hero, whose extinction I wept without precisely understanding it. As I read, however, I applied much personally to my own feelings and condition. I found myself similar, yet at the same time strangely unlike, to the beings concerning whom I read, and to whose conversation I was a listener. I sympathized with, and partly understood them, but I was unformed in mind. I was dependent on none, and related to none. The path of my departure was free, and there was none to lament my annihilation. My person was hideous, and my stature gigantic. What did this mean? Who was I? What was I? Whence did I come? What was my destination? These questions continually recurred, but I was unable to solve them. 
the volume of Plutarch's Lives, which I possessed, contained the histories of the first founders of the ancient republics. This book had a far different effect on me from the sorrows of Werther. I learned from Werther's imaginations despondency and gloom, but Plutarch taught me high thoughts. He elevated me above the wretched sphere of my own reflections, to admire and love the heroes of past ages. Many things I read surpassed my understanding and experience. I had a very confused knowledge of kingdoms, wide extents of country, mighty rivers and boundless seas, but I was perfectly unacquainted with towns and large assemblages of men. The cottage of my protectors had been the only school in which I had studied human nature, but this book developed new and mightier scenes of action. I read of men concerned in public affairs, governing or massacring their species. I felt the greatest ardor for virtue rise within me, an abhorrence for vice, as far as I understood the signification of those terms, relative as they were, as I applied them, to pleasure and pain alone. Induced by these feelings, I was of course led to admire peaceable lawgivers, Numa, Solon, and Lycurgus, in preference to Romulus and Theseus. The patriarchal lives of my protectors caused these impressions to take a firm hold on my mind. Perhaps, if my first introduction to humanity had been made by a young soldier burning for glory and slaughter, I should have been imbued with different sensations. But Paradise Lost excited different and far deeper emotions. I read it, as I'd read the other volumes which had fallen into my hands, as a true history. It moved every feeling of wonder and awe that the picture of an omnipotent God warring with his creatures was capable of exciting. I often referred the several situations, as their similarity struck me, to my own. Like Adam, I was apparently united by no link to any other being in existence. But his state was far different from mine in every other respect. He had come forth from the hands of a god, a perfect creature, happy and prosperous, guarded by the especial care of his creator. He was allowed to converse with and acquire knowledge from beings of a superior nature, but I was wretched, helpless, and alone. Many times I considered Satan as the fitter emblem of my condition, for often, like him, when I viewed the bliss of my protectors, the bitter gall of envy rose within me. Another circumstance strengthened and confirmed these feelings. Soon after my arrival in the hovel, I discovered some papers in the pocket of the dress which I had taken from your laboratory. At first I had neglected them, but now that I was able to decipher the characters in which they were written, I began to study them with diligence. It was your journal of the four months that preceded my creation. You minutely described in these papers every step you took in the progress of your work. This history was mingled with accounts of domestic occurrences. You doubtless recollect these papers. Here they are. Everything is related in them which bears reference to my accursed origin. The whole detail of that series of disgusting circumstances which produced it is set in view. The minutest description of my odious and loathsome person is given, in language which painted your own horrors and rendered mine indelible. I sickened as I read. Hateful day when I receive life! I exclaimed in agony. Accursed creator, why did you form a monster so hideous that even you turned from me in disgust? God in pity made man beautiful and alluring after his own image, but my form is a filthy type of yours, more horrid even from the very resemblance. Satan had his companions, fellow devils, to admire and encourage him, but I am solitary and abhorred. These were the reflections of my hours of despondency and solitude, but when I contemplated the virtues of the cottagers, their amiable and benevolent dispositions, I persuaded myself that when they should become acquainted with my admiration of their virtues, they would compassionate me and overlook my personal deformity. Could they turn from their door one, however monstrous, who solicited their compassion and friendship? I resolved at least not to despair, but in every way to fit myself for an interview with them which would decide my fate. I postponed this attempt for some months longer, for the importance attached to its success inspired me with a dread lest I should fail. Besides, I found that my understanding improved so much with every day's experience that I was unwilling to commence this undertaking until a few more months could have added to my sagacity. Several changes in the meantime took place in the cottage. The presence of Safi diffused happiness among its inhabitants, and I also found that a greater degree of plenty reigned there. Felix and Agatha spent more time in amusement and conversation, and were assisted in their labors by servants. They did not appear rich— but they were contented and happy. Their feelings were serene and peaceful, while mine became every day more tumultuous. 
increase of knowledge only discovered to me more clearly what a wretched outcast I was. I cherished hope, it's true, but it vanished when I beheld my person reflected in water or my shadow in the moonshine, even as that frail image and that inconstant shade. I endeavored to crush these fears and to fortify myself for the trial which in a few months I resolved to undergo, and sometimes I allowed my thoughts, unchecked by reason, to ramble in the fields of paradise, and dared to fancy amiable and lovely creatures sympathizing with my feelings and cheering my gloom, their angelic countenances breathed smiles of consolation. But it was all a dream. No eve soothed my sorrows nor shared my thoughts. I was alone. I remembered Adam's supplication to his Creator, but where was mine? He had abandoned me, and in the bitterness of my heart I cursed him. Autumn passed thus. I saw with surprise and grief the leaves decay and fall, and nature again assume the barren and bleak appearance it had worn when I first beheld the woods and the lovely moon. Yet I did not heed the bleakness of the weather. I was better fitted by my confirmation for the endurance of cold than heat. But my chief delights were the sight of the flowers, the birds, and all the gay apparel of summer. When those deserted me, I turned with more attention towards the cottagers. Their happiness was not decreased by the absence of summer. They loved and sympathized with one another, and their joys, depending on each other, were not interrupted by the casualties that took place around them. The more I saw of them, the greater became my desire to claim their protection and kindness. My heart yearned to be known and loved by these amiable creatures. To see their sweet looks directed towards me with affection was the utmost limit of my ambition. I dared not think that they would turn them from me with disdain and horror. The poor that stopped at their door were never driven away. I asked, it is true, for greater treasures than a little food or rest. I required kindness and sympathy, but I did not believe myself utterly unworthy of it. The winter advanced, and an entire revolution of the seasons had taken place since I awoke into life. My attention at this time was solely directed towards my plan of introducing myself into the cottage of my protectors. I revolved many projects, but that on which I finally fixed was to enter the dwelling when the blind old man should be alone. I had sagacity enough to discover that the unnatural hideousness of my person was the chief object of horror with those who had formerly beheld me. My voice, although harsh, had nothing terrible in it. I thought, therefore, that if in the absence of his children I could gain the good will and mediation of the old de Lacy, I might by his means be tolerated by my younger protectors. One day, when the sun shone on the red leaves that strewed the ground in diffused cheerfulness, although it denied warmth, Safi, Agatha, and Felix departed on a long country walk, and the old man, at his own desire, was left alone in the cottage. When his children had departed, he took up his guitar and played several mournful but sweet airs, more sweet and mournful than I'd ever heard him play before. At first his countenance was illuminated with pleasure, but as he continued, thoughtfulness and sadness succeeded. At length, laying aside the instrument, he sat absorbed in reflection. My heart beat quick. This was the hour and moment of trial which would decide my hopes or realize my fears. The servants were gone to a neighboring fair. All was silent in and around the cottage. It was an excellent opportunity. Yet when I proceeded to execute my plan, my limbs failed me, and I sank to the ground. Again I rose, and exerting all the firmness of which I was master, removed the planks which I had placed before my hovel to conceal my retreat. The fresh air revived me, and with renewed determination I approached the door of their cottage. I knocked. "'Who is there?' said the old man. "'Come in.' I entered. "'Pardon this intrusion,' I said. "'I'm a traveller in want of a little rest. You would greatly oblige me if you would allow me to remain a few minutes before the fire.' Enter, said de Lacy, and I will try in what manner I can to relieve your wants, but unfortunately my children are from home, and as I'm blind I'm afraid I should find it difficult to procure food for you. Oh, do not trouble yourself, my kind host. I have food. It is warmth and rest only that I need. I sat down, and a silence ensued. I knew that every minute was precious to me, yet I remained irresolute in what manner to commence the interview. When the old man addressed me, "'By your language, stranger, I suppose you are my countryman. You are French?' "'No, but I was educated by a French family, and understand that language only. I am now going to claim the protection of some friends, whom I sincerely love, and of whose favor I have some hopes.' "'Are they Germans?' 
no, they're French, uh, but let us change the subject. I am an unfortunate and deserted creature. I look around, and I have no relation or friend upon earth. These amiable people to whom I go have never seen me, and know little of me. I am full of fears, for if I fail there, I am an outcast in the world forever. Oh, do not despair. To be friendless is indeed unfortunate, but the hearts of men, when unprejudiced by any obvious self-interest, are full of brotherly love and charity. Rely, therefore, on your hopes, and if these friends are good and amiable, do not despair. They are kind, they are the most excellent creatures in the world, but unfortunately they are prejudiced against me. I have good dispositions, my life has been hitherto harmless and in some degree beneficial, but a fatal prejudice clouds their eyes, and when they ought to see a feeling and kind friend, they behold only a detestable monster. That is indeed unfortunate. But if you are really blameless, cannot you undeceive them? I am about to undertake that task, and it is on that account that I feel so many overwhelming terrors. I tenderly love these friends. I have, unknown to them, been for many months in the habits of daily kindness toward them, but they believe that I wish to injure them, and that is the prejudice which I wish to overcome. Where do these friends reside? Near this spot. The old man paused, and then continued. If you will unreservedly confide to me the particulars of your tale, I perhaps may be of use in undeceiving them. I am blind, and cannot judge of your countenance, but there is something in your words which persuades me that you are sincere. I am poor and an exile, but it will afford me true pleasure to be in any way serviceable to a human creature. Excellent man! I thank you and accept your generous offer. You raise me from the dust by this kindness and I trust that by your aid I shall not be driven from the society and sympathy of your fellow-creatures. Heaven forbid, even if you were really criminal, for that can only drive you to desperation and not instigate you to virtue. I also am unfortunate. I and my family have been condemned, although innocent. Judge, therefore, if I do not feel for your misfortunes. How can I thank you, my best and only benefactor, from your lips first have I heard the voice of kindness directed toward me. I shall be forever grateful, and your present humanity assures me of success with those friends whom I am on the point of meeting. May I know the names and residence of those friends? I paused. This, I thought, was the moment of decision, which was to rob me of or bestow happiness on me forever. I struggled vainly for firmness sufficient to answer him, but the effort destroyed all my remaining strength. I sank on the chair and sobbed aloud. At that moment I heard the steps of my younger protectors. I had not a moment to lose. But seizing the hand of the old man, I cried, Now is the time. Save and protect me. You and your family are the friends whom I seek. Do not you desert me in the hour of trial. Great God! exclaimed the old man. Who are you? At that instant the cottage door was opened, and Felix, Safi, and Agatha entered. Who can describe their horror and consternation on beholding me? Agatha fainted, and Safi, unable to attend to her friend, rushed out of the cottage. Felix started forward, and with supernatural force tore me from his father, to whose knees I clung. In a transport of fury he dashed me to the ground and struck me violently with a stick. I could have torn him limb from limb as the lion rends the antelope, but my heart sank within me as with bitter sickness, and I refrained. I saw him on the point of repeating his blow, when, overcome by pain and anguish, I quitted the cottage, and in the general tumult escaped unperceived to my hovel. End of chapter 15 This is a LibriVox recording. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com This reading by Gordon Mackenzie Frankenstein by Mary Shelley Chapter 16 Cursed, cursed Creator! Why did I live? Why in that instant did I not extinguish the spark of existence which you had so wantonly bestowed? I know not. Despair had not yet taken possession of me. My feelings were those of rage and revenge. I could with pleasure have destroyed the cottage and its inhabitants, and have glutted myself with their shrieks and misery. When night came I quitted my retreat and wandered in the wood. 
and now no longer restrained by the fear of discovery, I gave vent to my anguish in fearful howlings. I was like a wild beast that had broken the toils, destroying the objects that obstructed me and ranging through the wood with a stag-like swiftness. Oh, what a miserable night I passed! The cold stars shone in mockery, and the bare trees waved their branches above me. Now and then the sweet voice of a bird burst forth amidst the universal stillness. All, save I, were at rest or in enjoyment. I, like the arch-fiend, bore a hell within me, and finding myself unsympathized with, wished to tear up the trees, spread havoc and destruction around me, and then to have sat down and enjoyed the ruin. But this was a luxury of sensation that could not endure. I became fatigued with excess of bodily exertion and sank on the damp grass in the sick impotence of despair. There was none among the myriads of men that existed who would pity or assist me. And should I feel kindness towards my enemies? No. From that moment I declared everlasting war against the species, and more than all, against him who had formed me and sent me forth to this insupportable misery. The sun rose. I heard the voices of men and knew that it was impossible to return to my retreat during that day. Accordingly, I hid myself in some thick underwood, determining to devote the ensuing hours to reflection on my situation. The pleasant sunshine and the pure air of day restored me to some degree of tranquillity, and when I considered what had passed at the cottage, I could not help believing that I had been too hasty in my conclusions. I had certainly acted imprudently. It was apparent that my conversation had interested the father in my behalf, and I was a fool in having exposed my person to the horror of his children. I ought to have familiarized the old de Lacy to me and by degrees to have discovered myself to the rest of his family, when they should have been prepared for my approach. But I did not believe my errors to be irretrievable, and after much consideration I resolved to return to the cottage, seek the old man, and by my representations win him to my party. These thoughts calmed me, and in the afternoon I sank into a profound sleep. But the fever of my blood did not allow me to be visited by peaceful dreams. The horrible scene of the preceding day was forever acting before my eyes. The females were flying and the enraged Felix tearing me from his father's feet. I awoke exhausted, and finding that it was already night, I crept forth from my hiding place and went in search of food. When my hunger was appeased, I directed my steps towards the well-known path that conducted to the cottage. All there was at peace. I crept into my hovel and remained in silent expectation of the accustomed hour when the family arose. That hour passed. The sun mounted high in the heavens, but the cottagers did not appear. I trembled violently, apprehending some dreadful misfortune. The inside of the cottage was dark, and I heard no motion. I cannot describe the agony of this suspense. Presently two countrymen passed by, but pausing near the cottage they entered into conversation using violent gesticulations. But I did not understand what they said as they spoke the language of the country, which differed from that of my protectors. Soon after, however, Felix approached with another man. I was surprised as I knew that he had not quitted the cottage that morning and waited anxiously to discover from his discourse the meaning of these unusual appearances. "'Do you consider,' said his companion to him, "'that you will be obliged to pay three months' rent and to lose the produce of your garden? I do not wish to take any unfair advantage, and I beg, therefore, that you will take some days to consider of your determination.' "'It is utterly useless,' replied Felix. "'We can never again inhabit your cottage. The life of my father is in the greatest danger.' owing to the dreadful circumstances that I have related. My wife and my sister will never recover from their horror. I entreat you not to reason with me any more. 
take possession of your tenement and let me fly from this place. Felix trembled violently as he said this. He and his companion entered the cottage in which they remained for a few minutes, and then departed. I never saw any of the family of de Lacy more. I continued for the remainder of the day in my hovel in a state of utter and stupid despair. My protectors had departed and had broken the only link that held me to the world. For the first time the feelings of revenge and hatred filled my bosom, and I did not strive to control them. But allowing myself to be borne away by the stream, I bent my mind towards injury and death. When I thought of my friends, of the mild voice of de Lacy, the gentle eyes of Agatha, and the exquisite beauty of the Arabian, these thoughts vanished, and a gush of tears somewhat soothed me. But again, when I reflected that they had spurned and deserted me, anger returned, a rage of anger, and unable to injure anything human, I turned my fury towards inanimate objects. As night advanced, I placed a variety of combustibles around the cottage, and after having destroyed every vestige of cultivation in the garden, I waited with forced impatience until the moon had sunk to commence my operations. As the night advanced, a fierce wind arose from the woods and quickly dispersed the cloud that had loitered in the heavens. The blast tore along like a mighty avalanche, and produced a kind of insanity in my spirits that burst all bounds of reason and reflection. I lighted the dry branch of a tree and danced with fury around the devoted cottage. My eyes still fixed on the western horizon, my brand. It sank, and with a loud scream I fired the straw and heath and bushes which I had collected. The wind fanned the fire, and the cottage was quickly enveloped by the flames, which clung to it and licked it with their forked and destroying tongues. As soon as I was convinced that no assistance could save any part of the habitation, I quitted the scene and sought for refuge in the woods. And now, with the world before me, whither should I bend my steps? I resolved to fly far from the scene of my misfortunes. But to me, hated and despised, every country must be equally horrible. At length, the thought of you crossed my mind. I learned from your papers that you were my father, my creator, and to whom could I apply with more fitness than to him who had given me life? Among the lessons that Felix had bestowed upon Safi, geography had not been omitted. I had learned from these the relative situations of the different countries of the earth. You had mentioned Geneva as the name of your native town, and towards this place I resolved to proceed. But how was I to direct myself? I knew that I must travel in a southwesterly direction to reach my destination, but the sun was my only guide. I did not know the names of the towns that I was to pass through, nor could I ask information from a single human being. But I did not despair. From you only could I hope for succor, although towards you I felt no sentiment but that of hatred. Unfeeling, heartless creator! You had endowed me with perceptions and passions, and then cast me abroad an object for the scorn and horror of mankind. But on you only had I any claim for pity and redress, and from you I determined to seek that justice which I vainly attempted to gain from any other being that wore the human form. My travels were long, and the sufferings I endured intense. It was late in autumn when I quitted the district where I had so long resided. I travelled only at night, fearful of encountering the visage of a human being. Nature decayed around me, and the sun became heatless. Rain and snow poured around me. Mighty rivers were frozen. The surface of the earth was hard and chill 
and bare, and I found no shelter. O oh, earth, how often did I imprecate curses on the cause of my being! The mildness of my nature had fled, and all within me was turned to gall and bitterness. The nearer I approached your habitation, the more deeply did I feel the spirit of revenge enkindled in my heart. Snow fell, and the waters were hardened, but I rested not. A few incidents now and then directed me, and I possessed a map of the country, but I often wandered wide from my path. The agony of my feelings allowed me no respite. No incident occurred from which my rage and misery could not extract its food. But a circumstance that happened when I arrived on the confines of Switzerland, when the sun had recovered its warmth and the earth again began to look green, confirmed in an especial manner the bitterness and horror of my feelings. I generally rested during the day, and travelled only when I was secured by night from the view of man. One morning, however, finding that my path lay through a deep wood, I ventured to continue my journey after the sun had risen. The day, which was one of the first of spring, cheered even me by the loveliness of its sunshine and the balminess of the air. I felt emotions of gentleness and pleasure that had long appeared dead revive within me. Half surprised by the novelty of these sensations, I allowed myself to be borne away by them, and forgetting my solitude and deformity, dared to be happy. Soft tears again bedewed my cheeks, and I even raised my humid eyes with thankfulness towards the blessed sun which bestowed such joy upon me. I continued to wind among the paths of the wood, until I came to its boundary, which was skirted by a deep and rapid river, into which many of the trees bent their branches, now budding with the fresh spring. Here I paused, not exactly knowing what path to pursue, when I heard the sound of voices that induced me to conceal myself under the shade of a cypress. I was scarcely hid when a young girl came running towards the spot where I was concealed, laughing, as if she ran from someone in sport. She continued her course along the precipitous sides of the river when suddenly her foot slipped, and she fell into the rapid stream. I rushed from my hiding place, and with extreme labor, from the force of the current, saved her and dragged her to shore. She was senseless, and I endeavored by every means in my power to restore animation the deeper parts of the woods. I followed speedily, I, I hardly knew why, but when the man saw me drew near, he aimed a gun, which he carried at my body and fired. I sank to the ground, and my injurer, with increased swiftness, escaped into the wood. This was then the reward of my benevolence. I had saved a human being from destruction. The feelings of kindness and gentleness which I had entertained but a few moments before gave place to hellish rage and gnashing of teeth. Inflamed by pain, I vowed eternal hatred and vengeance to all mankind. But the agony of my wound overcame me. My pulses paused, and I fainted. For some weeks I led a miserable life in the woods endeavoring to cure the wound which I had received. The ball had entered my shoulder, and I knew not whether it had remained there or passed through. At any rate, I had no means of extracting it. My sufferings were augmented also by the oppressive sense of the injustice and ingratitude of their infliction. My daily vows rose for revenge, a deep and deadly revenge such as would alone compensate for the outrages and anguish I had endured. After some weeks my wound healed, and I continued my journey. The labors I endured were no longer to be alleviated by the bright sun or gentle breezes of spring. All joy was but a mockery which insulted my desolate state and made me feel more painfully that I was not made for the enjoyment of pleasure. But my toils now drew near a close, 
and in two months from this time I reached the environs of Geneva. It was evening when I arrived, and I retired to a hiding place among the fields that surround it, to meditate in what manner I should apply to you. I was oppressed by fatigue and hunger, and far too unhappy to enjoy the gentle breezes of evening, or the prospect of the sun setting behind the stupendous mountains of Jura. At this time a slight sleep relieved me from the pain of reflection, which was disturbed by the approach of a beautiful child, who came running into the recess I had chosen with all the sportiveness of infancy. Suddenly, as I gazed on him, an idea seized me that this little creature was unprejudiced, and had lived too short a time to have imbibed a horror of deformity. If, therefore, I could seize him and educate him as my companion and friend, I should not be so desolate in this peopled earth. Urged by this impulse, I seized on the boy as he passed and drew him towards me. As soon as he beheld my form, he placed his hands before his eyes and uttered a sh— I drew his hand forcibly from his face and said, Child, what is the meaning of this? I do not intend to hurt you. Listen to me. He struggled violently. Let me go, he cried. Monster! Ugly wretch! You wish to eat me and tear me to pieces. You are an ogre. Let me go, or I will tell my papa. Boy, you will never see your father again. You must come with me. Hideous monster! Let me go! My papa is a syndic. He is Monsieur Frankenstein. He will punish you. You dare not keep me. Frankenstein. You belong then to my enemy, to him towards whom I have sworn eternal revenge. You shall be my first victim. The child still struggled and loaded me with epithets which carried despair to my heart. I grasped his throat to silence him, and in a moment he lay dead at my feet. I gazed on my victim, and my heart swelled with exultation and hellish triumph. Clapping my hands, I exclaimed, I, too, can create desolation. My enemy is not invulnerable. This death will carry despair to him, and a thousand other miseries shall torment and destroy him. As I fixed my eyes on the child, I saw something glittering on his breast. I took it. It was a portrait of a most lovely woman. In spite of my malignity, it softened and attracted me. For a few moments I gazed with delight on her dark eyes, fringed by dark lashes, and her lovely lips. But presently my rage returned. I remembered that I was forever deprived of the delights that such beautiful creatures could bestow, and that she whose resemblance I contemplated would, in regarding me, have changed that air of divine benignity to one expressive of disgust and of fright. Can you wonder that such thoughts transported me with rage? I only wonder that at that moment, instead of venting my sensations in exclamations and agony, I did not rush among mankind and perish in the attempt to destroy them. While I was overcome by these feelings, I left the spot where I had committed the murder and seeking a more secluded hiding-place, I entered a barn, which had appeared to me to be empty. A woman was sleeping on some straw. She was young, not indeed so beautiful as her, whose portrait I held, but of an agreeable aspect and blooming in the loveliness of youth and health. Here, I thought, is one of those whose joy-imparting smiles are bestowed on all but me. And then I bent over her, and whispered, Awake, fairest, thy lover is near. He would give his life but to obtain one look of affection from thine eyes. My beloved, awake. The sleeper stirred. A thrill of terror ran through me. Should she indeed awake and see me and curse me and denounce the murderer? Thus, would she assuredly act if her darkened eyes opened and she beheld me. The thought was madness. It stirred from the fiend within me. Not I, but she shall suffer. The murder I have committed because I am forever robbed of all that she could give me, she shall atone. 
the crime had its source in her, be hers the punishment. Thanks to the lessons of Felix and the sanguinary laws of man, I had learned now to work mischief. I bent over her, and placed the portrait securely in one of the folds of her dress. She moved again, and I fled. For some days I haunted the spot where these scenes had taken place, sometimes wishing to see you, sometimes resolved to quit the world and its miseries forever. At length I wandered towards these mountains, and have ranged through their immense recesses consumed by a burning passion which you alone can gratify. We may not part until you have promised to comply with my requisition. I am alone and miserable. Man will not associate with me, but one as deformed and horrible as myself would not deny herself to me. My companion must be of the same species and have the same defects. This being you must create. End chapter 16 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. Today's reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Chapter 17 The being finished speaking and fixed his looks upon me in the expectation of a reply. But I was bewildered, perplexed, and unable to arrange my ideas sufficiently to understand the full extent of his proposition. He continued, You must create a female for me, with whom I can live in the interchange of those sympathies necessary for my being. This you alone can do, and I demand it of you as a right which you must not refuse to concede. The latter part of his tale had kindled anew in me the anger that had died away while he narrated his peaceful life among the cottagers. And as he said this, I could no longer suppress the rage that burned within me. "'I do refuse it,' I replied, "'and no torture shall ever extort a consent from me. You may render me the most miserable of men, but you shall never make me base in my own eyes. Shall I create another like yourself, whose joint wickedness might desolate the world? Be gone. I have answered you. You may torture me, but I will never consent.' "'You are in the wrong,' replied the fiend. "'And instead of threatening, I am content to reason with you. "'I am malicious because I am miserable. "'Am I not shunned and hated by all mankind? "'You, my Creator, would tear me to pieces and triumph. "'Remember that, and tell me why I should pity man more than he pities me.' You would not call it murder if you could precipitate me into one of those ice rifts and destroy my frame, the work of your own hands. Shall I respect man when he condemns me? Let him live with me in the interchange of kindness, and instead of injury I would bestow every benefit upon him with tears of gratitude at his acceptance. But that cannot be. The human senses are insurmountable barriers to our union. Yet mine shall not be the submission of abject slavery. I will revenge my injuries. If I cannot inspire love, I will cause fear, and chiefly towards you, my arch-enemy. Because my creator, do I swear inextinguishable hatred. Have a care. I will work at your destruction nor finish until I desolate your heart, so that you shall curse the hour of your birth. A fiendish rage animated him as he said this. His face was wrinkled into contortions too horrible for human eyes to behold. Presently he calmed himself and proceeded. I intend to reason. This passion is detrimental to me, for you do not reflect that you are the cause of its success. If any being felt emotions of benevolence towards me, I should return them a hundred and a hundredfold. But for that one creature's sake, I would make peace with the whole kind. 
but I now indulge in dreams of bliss that cannot be realized. What I ask of you is reasonable and moderate. I demand a creature of another sex, but as hideous as myself. The gratification is small, but it is all that I can receive, and it shall content me. It is true. We shall be monsters, cut off from all the world. But on that account, we shall be more attached to one another. Our lives will not be happy, but they will be harmless and free from the misery I now feel. Oh, my Creator, make me happy! Let me feel gratitude towards you for one benefit. Let me see that I excite the sympathy of some existing thing. Do not deny me my request. I was moved. I shuddered when I thought of the possible consequences of my consent but I felt that there was some justice in his argument. His tale and the feelings he now expressed proved him to be a creature of fine sensations. And did I not, as his maker, owe him all the portion of happiness that it was in my power to bestow? He saw my change of feelings, and continued, If you consent, neither you nor any other human being shall ever see us again. I will go to the vast wilds of South America. My food is not that of man. I do not destroy the lamb and the kid to glut my appetite. Acorns and berries afford me sufficient nourishment. My companion will be of the same nature as myself and will be content with the same fare. We shall make a bed of dried leaves. The sun will shine on us as on man and will ripen our food. The picture I present to you is peaceful and human, and you must feel that you could deny it only in the wantonness of power and cruelty. Pitiless as you have been towards me, I now see compassion in your eyes. Let me seize the favorable moment and persuade you to promise what I so ardently desire. You propose, replied I, to fly from the habitations of man to dwell in those wilds where the beasts of the field will be your only companions. How can you, who long for the love and sympathy of man, persevere in this exile? You will return and again seek their kindness, and you will meet with their detestation. Your evil passions will be renewed, and you will then have a companion to aid you in the task of destruction. This may not be. Cease to argue the point, for I cannot consent. How inconstant are your feelings! But a moment ago you were moved by my representations. And why do you again harden yourself to my complaints? I swear to you, by the earth which I inhabit and by you that made me, that with the companion you bestow I will quit the neighborhood of man and dwell, as it may chance, in the most savage of places. My evil passions will have fled, for I shall meet with sympathy. My life will flow quietly away, and in my dying moments I shall not curse my Maker. His words had a strange effect upon me. I compassionated him, and sometimes felt a wish to console him. But when I looked upon him, when I saw the filthy mass that moved and talked, my heart sickened and my feelings were altered to those of horror and hatred. I tried to stifle these sensations. I thought that as I could not sympathize with him, I had no right to withhold from him the small portion of happiness which was yet in my power to bestow. You swear, I said, to be harmless, but have you not already shown a degree of malice that should reasonably make me distrust you? May not even this be a feint that will increase your triumph by affording a wider scope for your revenge? How is this? I must not be trifled with, and I demand an answer. If I have no ties and no affections, hatred and vice must be my portion. The love of another will destroy the cause of my crimes, 
and I shall become a thing of whose existence everyone will be ignorant. My vices are the children of a forced solitude that I abhor, and my virtues will necessarily arise when I live in communion with an equal. I shall feel the affections of a sensitive being and become linked to the chain of existence and events from which I am now excluded. I paused some time to reflect on all he had related, and the various arguments which he had employed. I thought of the promise of virtues which he had displayed on the opening of his existence and the subsequent blight of all kindly feeling by the loathing and scorn which his protectors had manifested towards him. His power and threats were not omitted in my calculations. A creature who could exist in the ice caves of the glaciers and hide himself from pursuit among the ridges of inaccessible precipices was a being possessing faculties it would be vain to cope with. After a long pause of reflection, I concluded that the justice due both to him and my fellow creatures demanded of me that I should comply with his request. Turning to him, therefore, I said, I consent to your demand, on your solemn oath to quit Europe forever, and every other place in the neighborhood of man, as soon as I shall deliver into your hands a female who will accompany you in your exile. I swear, he cried, by the sun, and by the blue sky of heaven, and by the fire of love that burns my heart, that if you grant my prayer, while they exist you shall never behold me again. Depart to your home and commence your labors. I shall watch their progress with unutterable anxiety. And fear not, but that when you are ready, I shall appear. Saying this, he suddenly quitted me, fearful perhaps of any change in my sentiments. I saw him descend the mountain with greater speed than the flight of an eagle, and quickly lost among the undulations of the sea of ice. His tail had occupied the whole day, and the sun was on the verge of the horizon when he departed. I knew that I ought to hasten my descent towards the valley, as I should soon be encompassed in darkness. But my heart was heavy and my steps slow. The labor of winding among the little paths of the mountain, and fixing my feet firmly as I advanced, perplexed me, occupied as I was by the emotions which the occurrences of the day had produced. Night was far advanced when I came to the halfway resting place, and seated myself beside the fountain. The stars shone at intervals as the clouds passed from over them. The dark pines rose before me, and every here and there a broken tree lay on the ground. It was a scene of wonderful solemnity, and stirred strange thoughts within me. I wept bitterly, and clasping my hands in agony I exclaimed, O oh, stars and clouds and winds, you are all about to mock me. If you really pity me, crush sensation and memory. Let me become as naught. But if not, depart, depart, and leave me in darkness. These were wild and miserable thoughts. But I cannot describe to you how the eternal twinkling of the stars weighed upon me, and how I listened to every blast of wind as if it were a dull, ugly siroc on its way to consume me. Morning dawned before I arrived at the village of Chamonix. I took no rest, but returned immediately to Geneva. Even in my own heart I could give no expression to my sensations. They weighed on me with a mountain's weight, and their excess destroyed my agony beneath them. Thus I returned home, and entering the house presented myself to the family. My haggard and wild appearance awoke intense alarm, but I answered no question. Scarcely did I speak. I felt as if I were placed under a ban, as if I had no right to claim their sympathies, as if never more might I enjoy companionship with them. Yet even thus I loved them to adoration, and, to save them, I resolved to dedicate myself to my most abhorred task. The prospect of such an occupation made every other circumstance of existence pass before me like a dream, and that thought only had to me the reality of life. End of chapter 17 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. Today's reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Chapter 18 Day after day, week after week passed away on my return to Geneva, and I could not collect the courage to recommence my work. I feared the vengeance of the disappointed fiend, yet I was unable to overcome my repugnance to the task which was enjoined me. I found that I could not compose a female without again devoting several months to profound study and laborious disquisition. I had heard of some discoveries having been made by an English philosopher, the knowledge of which was material to my success, and I sometimes thought of obtaining my father's consent to visit England for this purpose. But I clung to every pretense of delay, and shrank from taking the first step in an undertaking whose immediate necessity began to appear less absolute to me. A change indeed had taken place in me. My health, which had hitherto declined, was now much restored, and my spirits, when unchecked by the memory of my unhappy promise, rose proportionably. My father saw this change with pleasure, and he turned his thoughts towards the best method of eradicating the remains of my melancholy, which every now and then would return by fits, and with a devouring blackness overcast the approaching sunshine. At these moments I took refuge in the most perfect solitude. I passed whole days on the lake alone in a little boat, watching the clouds and listening to the rippling of the waves, silent and listless. But the fresh air and bright sun seldom failed to restore me to some degree of composure, and on my return I met the salutations of my friends with a readier smile and a more cheerful heart. It was after my return from one of these rambles that my father, calling me aside, thus addressed me. I am happy to remark, my dear son, that you have resumed your former pleasures and seem to be returning to yourself. And yet you are still unhappy, and still avoid our society. For some time I was lost in conjecture as to the cause of this, but yesterday an idea struck me, and if it is well founded, I conjure you to avow it. Reserve on such a point would be not only useless, but draw down treble misery on us all. I trembled violently at his exordium, and my father continued. I confess, my son, that I have always looked forward to your marriage with our dear Elizabeth as the tie of our domestic comfort and the stay of my declining years. You were attached to each other from your earliest infancy. You studied together, and appeared in dispositions and tastes entirely suited to one another. But so blind is the experience of man that what I conceive to be the best assistance to my plan may have entirely destroyed it. You, perhaps, regarded her as your sister, without any wish that she might become your wife. Nay, you may have met with another whom you may love, and considering yourself as bound in honour to Elizabeth, this struggle may occasion the poignant misery which you appear to feel. My dear father, reassure yourself. I love my cousin tenderly and sincerely. I never saw any woman who excited, as Elizabeth does, my warmest admiration and affection. My future hopes and prospects are entirely bound up in the expectation of our union. The expression of your sentiments on this subject, my dear Victor, gives me more pleasure than I have for some time experienced. If you feel thus, we shall assuredly be happy, however present events may cast a gloom over us. But it is this gloom which appears to have taken so strong a hold of your mind that I wish to dissipate. Tell me, therefore, whether you object to an immediate solemnization of the marriage. We have been unfortunate, and recent events have drawn us from that everyday tranquillity befitting my years and infirmities. You are younger, yet I do not suppose, possessed as you are of a competent fortune, that an early marriage would at all interfere with any future plans of honour and utility that you may have formed. Do not suppose, however, that I 
wish to dictate happiness to you, or that a delay on your part would cause me any serious uneasiness. Interpret my words with candor, and answer me, I conjure you, with confidence and sincerity. I listened to my father in silence, and remained for some time incapable of offering any reply. I revolved rapidly in my mind a multitude of thoughts, and endeavored to arrive at some conclusion. Alas! To me the idea of an immediate union with my Elizabeth was one of horror and dismay. I was bound by a solemn promise which I had not yet fulfilled, and dared not break. Or if I did, what manifold miseries might not impend over me and my devoted family? Could I enter into a festival with this deadly weight yet hanging round my neck and bowing me to the ground? I must perform my engagement, and let the monster depart with his mate before I allowed myself to enjoy the delight of a union from which I expected peace. I remembered also the necessity imposed upon me of either journeying to England, or entering into a long correspondence with those philosophers of that country whose knowledge and discoveries were of indispensable use to me in my present undertaking. The latter method of obtaining the desired intelligence was dilatory and unsatisfactory. Besides, I had an insurmountable aversion to the idea of engaging myself in my loathsome task in my father's house, while in habits of familiar intercourse with those I loved. I knew that a thousand fearful accidents might occur, the slightest of which would disclose a tale to thrill all connected with me with horror. I was aware also that I should often lose all self-command all capacity of hiding the harrowing sensations that would possess me during the progress of my unearthly occupation. I must absent myself from all I loved while thus employed. Once commenced, it would quickly be achieved, and I might be restored to my family in peace and happiness. My promise fulfilled, the monster would depart forever. Or, so my fond fancy imaged, some accident might meanwhile occur to destroy him, and put an end to my slavery forever. These feelings dictated my answer to my father. I expressed a wish to visit England, but concealing the true reasons of this request, I clothed my desires under a guise which excited no suspicion, while I urged my desire with an earnestness that easily induced my father to comply. After so long a period of an absorbing melancholy that resembled madness in its intensity and effects, he was glad to find that I was capable of taking pleasure in the idea of such a journey, and he hoped that change of scene and varied amusement would, before my return, have restored me entirely to myself. The duration of my absence was left to my own choice. A few months, or at most a year, was the period contemplated. One paternal kind precaution he had taken to ensure my having a companion. Without previously communicating with me, he had, in concert with Elizabeth, arranged that Clerval should join me at Strasbourg. This interfered with the solitude I coveted for the prosecution of my task. Yet at the commencement of my journey the presence of my friend could in no way be an impediment and truly I rejoiced that thus I should be saved many hours of lonely, maddening reflection. Nay, Henry might stand between me and the intrusion of my foe. If I were alone, would he not at times force his abhorred presence on me to remind me of my task, or to contemplate its progress? To England, therefore, I was bound, and it was understood that my union with Elizabeth should take place immediately on my return. My father's age rendered him extremely averse to delay. For myself there was one reward I promised myself from my detested toils, one consolation for my unparalleled sufferings. It was the prospect of that day, when, enfranchised from my miserable slavery, I might claim Elizabeth and forget the past in my union with her. I now made arrangements for my journey. But one feeling haunted me, which filled me with fear and agitation. During my absence I should leave my friends unconscious of the existence of their enemy, 
and unprotected from his attacks, exacerbated as he might be by my departure. But he had promised to follow me wherever I might go, and would he not accompany me to England? This imagination was dreadful in itself, but soothing inasmuch as it supposed the safety of my friends. I was agonized with the idea of the possibility that the reverse of this might happen. But through the whole period during which I was the slave of my creature, I allowed myself to be governed by the impulses of the moment, and my present sensation strongly intimated that the fiend would follow me and exempt my family from the danger of his machinations. It was in the latter end of September that I again quitted my native country. My journey had been my own suggestion, and Elizabeth therefore acquiesced, but she was filled with disquiet at the idea of my suffering away from her the inroads of misery and grief. It had been her care which provided me a companion in Clerval, and yet a man is blind to a thousand minute circumstances which call forth a woman's sedulous attention. She longed to bid me hasten my return. A thousand conflicting emotions rendered her mute as she bade me a tearful, silent farewell. I threw myself into the carriage that was to convey me away, hardly knowing whither I was going, and careless of what was passing around. I remembered only, and it was with a bitter anguish that I reflected on it, to order that my chemical instruments should be packed to go with me. Filled with dreary imaginations, I passed through many beautiful and majestic scenes, but my eyes were fixed and unobserving. I could only think of the bourne of my travels, and the work which was to occupy me whilst they endured. After some days spent in listless indolence, during which I traversed many leagues, I arrived at Strasbourg, where I waited two days for Clerval. He came. Alas, how great was the contrast between us! He was alive to every new scene, joyful when he saw the beauties of the setting sun, and more happy when he beheld it rise and recommence a new day. He pointed out to me the shifting colors of the landscape and the appearances of the sky. "'This is what it is to live!' he cried. "'How I enjoy existence! But you, my dear Frankenstein, wherefore are you desponding and sorrowful?' In truth I was occupied by gloomy thoughts, and neither saw the descent of the evening star nor the golden sunrise reflected in the Rhine. And you, my friend, would be far more amused with the journal of Clerval, who observed the scenery with an eye of feeling and delight, than in listening to my reflections. I, a miserable wretch, haunted by a curse that shut up every avenue to enjoyment. We had agreed to descend the Rhine in a boat from Strasbourg to Rotterdam, whence we might take shipping for London. During this voyage we passed many willowy islands, and saw several beautiful towns. We stayed a day at Mannheim, and on the fifth from our departure from Strasbourg, arrived at Mainz. The course of the Rhine below Mainz becomes much more picturesque. The river descends rapidly and winds between hills, not high but steep, and of beautiful forms. We saw many ruined castles standing on the edges of precipices surrounded by black woods, high and inaccessible. This part of the Rhine, indeed, presents a singularly variegated landscape. In one spot you view rugged hills, ruined castles overlooking tremendous precipices, with a dark Rhine rushing beneath. And on the sudden turn of a promontory, flourishing vineyards, with green sloping banks, and a meandering river and populous towns occupy the scene. We travelled at the time of the vintage, and heard the song of the labourers as we glided down the stream. Even I, depressed in mind and my spirits continually agitated by gloomy feelings, even I was pleased. I lay at the bottom of the boat, and as I gazed on the cloudless blue sky, I seemed to drink in a tranquillity to which I had long been a stranger. And if these were my sensations, who could describe those of Henry? He felt as if he had been transported to fairyland, and enjoyed a happiness seldom tasted by man. "'I have seen,' he said, "'the most beautiful scenes of my own country, 
I have visited the lakes of Lucerne and Uri, where the snowy mountains descend almost perpendicularly to the water, casting black and impenetrable shades, which would cause a gloomy and mournful appearance were it not for the most verdant islands that believe the eye by their gay appearance. I have seen this lake agitated by a tempest, when the wind tore up whirlwinds of water and gave you an idea of what the waterspout must be on the great ocean, and the waves dash with fury the base of the mountain, where the priest and his mistress were overwhelmed by an avalanche, and where their dying voices are still said to be heard amid the pauses of the nightly wind. I have seen the mountains of La Vallée and the Pays de Vaux, this country, Victor, pleases me more than all those wonders. The mountains of Switzerland are more majestic and strange, but there is a charm in the banks of this divine river that I never before saw equaled. Look at that castle which overhangs yon precipice, and that also on the island, almost concealed among the foliage of those beautiful trees. And now that group of laborers coming from among their vines, and that village half hid in the recess of the mountain. Oh, surely the spirit that inhabits and guards this place has a soul more in harmony with man than those who pile the glacier or retire to the inaccessible peaks of the mountains of our own country. Clerval, beloved friend, even now it delights me to record your words and to dwell on the praise of which you are so eminently deserving. He was a being formed in the very poetry of nature. His wild and enthusiastic imagination was chastened by the sensibility of his heart. His soul overflowed with ardent affections, and his friendship was of that devoted and wondrous nature that the world-minded teach us to look for only in the imagination. But even human sympathies were not sufficient to satisfy his eager mind. The scenery of external nature, which others regard only with admiration, he loved with ardor. Quote, the sounding cataract haunted him like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep gloomy wood, their colors and their forms, were then to him an appetite, a feeling, and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied, or any interest unborrowed from the eye. End quote. Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey. And where does he now exist? Is this gentle and lovely being lost forever? Has this mind so replete with ideas, imaginations fanciful and magnificent, which formed a world whose existence depended on the life of its creator, has this mind perished? Does it now only exist in my memory? No. It is not thus. Your form, so divinely wrought, and beaming with beauty, has decayed. But your spirit still visits and consoles your unhappy friend. Pardon this gush of sorrow. These ineffectual words are but a slight tribute to the unexampled worth of Henry. But they soothe my heart, overflowing with the anguish which his remembrance creates. I will proceed with my tale. Beyond Cologne we descended to the plains of Holland, and we resolved to post the remainder of our way, for the wind was contrary, and the stream of the river was too gentle to aid us. Our journey here lost the interest arising from beautiful scenery, but we arrived in a few days at Rotterdam, whence we proceeded by sea to England. It was on a clear morning, in the latter days of December, that I first saw the white cliffs of Britain. The banks of the Thames presented a new scene. They were flat, but fertile, and almost every town was marked by the remembrance of some story. We saw Tilbury Fort, and remembered the Spanish Armada, Gravesend, Woolwich, and Greenwich, places which I had heard of even in my country. At length we saw the numerous steeples of London, St. Paul's towering above them all, and the tower famed in English history. End of chapter 18 This is a LibriVox recording.
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsom.com. This reading by Megan Jane Daniels Suyasu. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Chapter 19 London was our present point of rest. We determined to remain several months in this wonderful and celebrated city. Clerval desired the intercourse of the men of genius and talent who flourished at this time. But this was with me a secondary object. I was principally occupied with the means of obtaining the information necessary for the completion of my promise, and quickly availed myself of the letters of introduction that I had brought with me, addressed to the most distinguished natural philosophers. If this journey had taken place during my days of study and happiness, it would have afforded me inexpressible pleasure. But a blight had come over my existence, and I only visited these people for the sake of the information they might give me on the subject in which my interest was so terribly profound. Company was irksome to me. When alone, I could fill my mind with the sights of heaven and earth. The voice of Henry soothed me, and I could thus cheat myself into a transitory peace. But busy, uninteresting, joyous faces brought back despair to my heart. I saw an insurmountable barrier placed between me and my fellow men. This barrier was sealed with the blood of William and Justine, and to reflect on the events connected with those names filled my soul with anguish. But in Clerval I saw the image of my former self. He was inquisitive and anxious to gain experience and instruction. The difference of manners which he observed was to him an inexhaustible source of instruction and amusement. He was also pursuing an object he had long had in view. His design was to visit India, in the belief that he had in his knowledge of its various languages, and in the views he had taken of its society, the means of materially assisting the progress of European colonization and trade. In Britain only could he further the execution of his plan. He was forever busy, and the only check to his enjoyments was my sorrowful and dejected mind. I tried to conceal this as much as possible, that I might not debar him from the pleasures natural to one who was entering on a new scene of life, undisturbed by any care or bitter recollection. I often refused to accompany him, alleging another engagement, that I might remain alone. I now also began to collect the materials necessary for my new creation, and this was to me like the torture of single drops of water continually falling on the head. Every thought that was devoted to it was an extreme anguish, and every word that I spoke in allusion to it caused my lips to quiver and my heart to palpitate. After passing some months in London, we received a letter from a person in Scotland who had formerly been our visitor at Geneva. He mentioned the beauties of his native country and asked us if those were not sufficient allurements to induce us to prolong our journey as far north as Perth, where he resided. Clearville eagerly desired to accept this invitation, and I, although I abhorred society, wished to again view mountains and streams and all the wondrous works with which nature adorns her chosen dwelling places. We had arrived in England at the beginning of October, and it was now February. We accordingly determined to commence our journey towards the north at the expiration of another month. In this expedition, we did not intend to follow the great road to Edinburgh, but to visit Windsor, Oxford, Matlock, and the Cumberland Lakes, resolving to arrive at the completion of this tour about the end of July. I packed up my chemical instruments and the materials I had collected, resolving to finish my labours in some obscure nook in the northern highlands of Scotland. We quitted London on the 27th of March, and remained a few days at Windsor, rambling in its beautiful forest. This was a new scene to us mountaineers. The majestic oaks, the quantity of game, and the herds of stately deer were all novelties to us. From thence we proceeded to Oxford. As we entered this city, our minds were filled with the remembrance of the events that had tra been transacted there more than a century and a half before. It was here that Charles I had collected his forces. This city had remained faithful to him, after the whole nation had forsaken his cause to join the standard of Parliament and Liberty. 
The memory of that unfortunate king and his companions, the amiable Falkland, the insolent Goring, his queen and son, gave a peculiar interest to every part of the city which they might have supposed to have inhabited. The spirit of elder days found a dwelling here, and we delighted to trace its footsteps. If these feelings had not found an imaginary gratification, the appearance of the city had yet in itself sufficient beauty to obtain our admiration. The colleges are ancient and picturesque, the streets are almost magnificent, and the lovely Isis, which flows beside it through meadows of exquisite verdure, is spread forth into a placid expanse of waters, which reflects its majestic assemblage of towers and spires and domes embosomed among aged trees. I enjoyed this scene, and yet my enjoyment was embittered both by the memory of the past and the anticipation of the future. I was formed for peaceful happiness. During my youthful days, discontent never visited my mind, and if ever I was overcome by an ennui, the sight of what is beautiful in nature or the study of what is excellent and sublime in the productions of man could always interest my heart and communicate elasticity to my spirits. But I am a blasted tree. The bolt has entered my soul, and I felt then that I should survive to exhibit what I shall soon cease to be, a miserable spectacle of wrecked humanity, pitiable to others and intolerable to myself. We passed a considerable period at Oxford, rambling amongst its environs and endeavouring to identify every spot which might relate to the most animating epoch of English history. Our little voyages of discovery were often prolonged by the successive objects that presented themselves. We visited the tomb of the illustrious Hamden and the field on which that patriot fell. For a moment my soul was elevated from its debasing and miserable fears to contemplate the divine ideas of liberty and self-sacrifice, of which these sites were the monuments and the remembrances. For an instant I dared to shake off my chains and look around me with a free and lofty spirit. But the iron had eaten into my flesh, and I sank again, trembling and hopeless, into my miserable self. We left Oxford with regret, and proceeded to Matlock, which was our next place of rest. The country in the neighbourhood of this village resembled, to a greater degree, the scenery of Switzerland, but everything is on a lower scale, and the green hills want the crown of distant white alps which always attend on the piney mountains of my native country. We visited the wondrous cave and the little cabinets of natural history where the curiosities are disposed in the same manner as in the collections at Servox and Chamonix. The latter name made me tremble when pronounced by Henry, and I hastened to quit Matlock, with which that terrible scene was thus associated. From Derby, still journeying northwards, we passed two months in Cumberland and Westmoreland. I can now almost fancy myself amongst the Swiss mountains. The little patches of snow which yet lingered on the northern sides of the mountains, the lakes, and the dashing of the rocking streams were all familiar and dear sights to me. Here also we made some acquaintances who almost contrived to cheat me into happiness. The delight of Clevel was proportionably greater than mine. His mind expanded in the company of men of talent, and he found in his own nature greater capacities and resources than he could have ever imagined himself to have possessed while he associated with his inferiors. I could pass my life here, he said to me, and among these mountains I should scarcely regret Switzerland and the Rhine. But he found that a traveller's life is one that includes much pain amidst its enjoyments. His feelings are forever on the stretch, and when he begins to sink into repose, he finds himself obliged to quit that on which he rests in pleasure for something new, which again engages his attention, and which he also forsakes for other novelties. We had scarcely visited the various lakes of Cumberland and Westmoreland, and conceived an affection for some of the inhabitants, when the period of our appointment with our Scotch friend approached, and we left them to travel on. For my own part, I was not sorry. I had now neglected my promise for some time, and I feared the effects of the demon's disappointment. 
He might remain in Switzerland and wreak his vengeance on my relatives. This idea pursued me and tormented me at every moment from which I might otherwise have snatched repose and peace. I waited for my letters with feverish impatience. If they were delayed, I was miserable and overcome by a thousand fears, and when they arrived and I saw the superscription of Elizabeth or my father, I hardly dared to read and ascertain my fate. Sometimes I thought that the fiend followed me and might expedite my remissness by murdering my companion. When these thoughts possessed me, I would not quit Henry for a moment, but followed him as his shadow to protect him from the fancied range of his destroyer. I felt as if I had committed some great crime, the consciousness of which haunted me. I was guiltless, but I had indeed drawn down some horrible curse upon my head, as mortal as that of crime. I visited Edinburgh with languid eyes and mind, and yet that city might have interested the most unfortunate being. Clairvaux did not like it so well as Oxford, for the antiquity of the latter city was more pleasing to him. But the beauty and regularity of the new town of Edinburgh, its romantic castle and its environs, the most delightful in the world, Arthur's Seat, Sir Barnard's Well, and the Pentland Hills compensated him for the change, and filled him with cheerfulness and admiration. But I was impatient to arrive at the termination of my journey. We left Edinburgh in a week, passing through Cooper, St Andrews, and along the banks of the Tay to Perth, where our friend greeted us. But I was in no mood to laugh and talk with strangers, or enter into their feelings or plans with the good humour expected from a guest, and, accordingly, I told Clerval that I wished to make the tour of Scotland alone. "'Do you,' said I, "'enjoy yourself, and let this be our rendezvous. I may be absent a month or two, but do not interfere with my motions, I entreat you. Leave me to peace and solitude for a short time, and when I return, I hope it will be with a lighter heart, more congenial to your own temper. Henry wished to dissuade me, but seeing me bent on this plan, ceased to remonstrate. He entreated me to write often. I had rather be with you, he said, in your solitary rambles than with these Scotch people whom I do not know. Hasten then, dear friend, to return, that I may again feel myself somewhat at home, which I cannot do in your absence. Having parted from my friend, I determined to visit some remote spot of Scotland and finish my work in solitude. I did not doubt but that the monster followed me and would discover himself to me when I should have finished, that he might receive his companion. With this resolution, I traversed the northern highlands and fixed on one of the remotest of the Orkneys as the scene of my labours. It was a place fitted for such a work being hardly more than a rock whose sides were continually beaten upon by the waves. The soil was barren, scarcely affording pasture for a few miserable cows and oatmeal for its inhabitants, which consisted of five persons, whose gaunt and scraggy limbs gave tokens of their miserable fare. Vegetables and bread, when they indulged in such luxuries, and even fresh water, was to be procured from the mainland, which was about five miles distant. On the whole island there were but three miserable huts, and one of these was vacant when I arrived. This I hired. It contained but two rooms, and these exhibited all the squalidness of the most miserable pernery. The thatch had fallen in, the walls were unplastered, and the door was off its hinges. I ordered it to be repaired, bought some furniture, and took possession, an incident which would doubtless have occasioned some surprise had not all the senses of the cottages been benumbed by want and squalid poverty. As it was, I lived ungazed at and unmolested, hardly thanked for the pittance of food and clothes which I gave, so much does suffering blunt even the coarsest sensations of men. In this retreat, I devoted the morning to labour, but in the evening, when the weather permitted, I walked on the stony beach of the sea to listen to the waves as they roared and dashed at my feet. It was a monotonous yet ever-changing scene. I thought of Switzerland. It was far different from this desolate and appalling landscape. Its hills are covered with vines, and its cottages are scattered thickly in the plains. Its fair lakes reflect a blue and gentle sky, 
and when troubled by the winds, their tumult is but but the play of a lively infant when compared to the roarings of the giant ocean. In this manner, I distributed my occupations when I first arrived, but as I proceeded in my labour, it became every day more horrible and irksome to me. Sometimes I could not prevail on myself to enter my laboratory for several days, and at other times I toiled day and night in order to complete my work. It was, indeed, a filthy process in which I was engaged. During my first experiment, a kind of enthusiastic frenzy had blinded me to the horror of my employment. My mind was intently fixed on the consummation of my labour, and my eyes were shut to the horror of my proceedings. But now I went to it in cold blood, and my heart often sickened at the work of my hands. Thus situated, employed in the most detestable occupation, immersed in a solitude where nothing could for an instant call my attention from the actual scene in which I was engaged, my spirits became unequal. I grew restless and nervous. Every moment I feared to meet my persecutor. Sometimes I sat with my eyes fixed on the ground, fearing to raise them lest they should encounter the object which I so much dreaded to behold. I feared to wander from the sight of my fellow creatures, lest when alone he should come to claim his companion. In the meantime I worked on, and my labour was already considerably advanced. I looked towards its completion with a tremulous and eager hope, which I dared not trust myself to question, but which was intermixed with obscure forebodings of evil that made my heart sicken in my bosom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsom.com. This reading by Megan Jane Daniel Suyasu. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Chapter 20. I sat one evening in my laboratory. The sun had set and the moon was just rising from the sea. I had not sufficient light for my employment, and I remained idle in a pause of consideration of whether I should leave my labour for the night, or hasten its conclusion by an unremitting attention to it. As I sat, a train of reflection occurred to me, which led me to consider the effects of what I was now doing. Three years before, I was engaged in the same manner, and had created a fiend whose unparalleled barbarity had desolated my heart, and filled it forever with the bitterest remorse. I was now about to form another being, of whose dispositions I was alike ignorant. She might become ten thousand times more malignant than her mate, and delight for its own sake in murder and wretchedness. He had sworn to quit the neighbourhood of man and hide himself in deserts, but she had not, and she, who in all probability was to become a thinking and reasoning animal, might refuse to comply with a compact made before her creation. They might even hate each other. The creature who already lived loathed his own deformity, and might he not conceive a greater abhorrence for it when it came before his eyes in the female form? She might also turn with disgust from him to the superior beauty of man. She might quit him, and he, being again alone, exasperated by the fresh provocation of being deserted by one of his own species. Even if they were to leave Europe and inhabit the deserts of the New World, yet one of the results of those sympathies for which the demon thirsted would be children, and a race of devils would be propagated upon the earth who might make the very existence of the species of man a condition precarious and full of terror. Had I right, for my own benefit, to inflict this curse upon everlasting generations? I had been moved by the sophisms of the being I had created. I had been struck senseless by his fiendish threats, but now, for the first time, the wickedness of my promise burst upon me. I shuddered to think that future ages might curse me as their pest, whose selfishness had not hesitated to buy its own peace at the price, perhaps, of the existence of the whole human race. I trembled, and my heart failed within me when, on looking up, 
I saw by the light of the moon the demon at the casement. A ghastly grin wrinkled his lips as he gazed on me, where I sat fulfilling the task which he had allotted to me. Yes, he had followed me in my travels. He had loitered in forests, hid himself in caves, or taken refuge in wide and desert heaths. And now he came to mark my progress and claim the fulfilment of my promise. As I looked on him, his countenance expressed the utmost extent of malice and treachery. I thought with a sensation of madness on my promise of creating another like to him, and, trembling with passion, tore to pieces the thing on which I was engaged. The wretch saw me destroy the creature on whose future existence he depended for happiness, and with a howl of devilish despair and revenge, withdrew. I left the room, and, locking the door, made a solemn vow in my own heart never to resume my labours, and then, with trembling steps, I sought my own apartment. I was alone. None were near me to dissipate the gloom and relieve me from the sickening oppression of the most terrible reveries. Several hours passed, and I remained near my window gazing on the sea. It was almost motionless, for the winds were hushed, and all nature reposed under the eye of the quiet moon. A few fishing vessels alone specked the water, and now and then the gentle breeze wafted the sound of voices as the fishermen called to one another. I felt the silence, although I was hardly conscious of its extreme profundity, until my ear was suddenly arrested by the paddling of oars near the shore, and a person landed close to my house. In a few minutes after, I heard the creaking of my door, as if someone endeavoured to open it softly. I trembled from head to foot. I felt a presentiment of who it was, and wished to rouse one of the peasants who dwelt in a cottage not far from mine, but I was overcome by the sensation of helplessness, so often felt in frightful dreams, when you in vain endeavour to fly from an impending danger, and was rooted to the spot. Presently, I heard the sound of footsteps along the passage, the door opened, and the wretch, whom I dreaded, appeared. Shutting the door, he approached me, and said in a smothered voice, You have destroyed the work which you began. Was it that you intend? Do you dare to break your promise? I have endured toil and misery. I left Switzerland with you. I crept along the shores of the Rhine, among its willow islands and over the summits of its hills. I have dwelt many months in the heaths of England and among the deserts of Scotland. I have endured incalculable fatigue and cold and hunger. Do you dare destroy my hopes? Be gone! I do break my promise. Never will I create another like yourself, equal in deformity and wickedness. Slave, I before reasoned with you, but you have proved yourself unworthy of my condescension. Remember that I have power. You believe yourself miserable, but I can make you so wretched that the light of day will be hateful to you. You are my creator, but I am your master. Obey! The hour of my irresolution is past, and the period of your power is arrived. Your threats cannot move me to do an act of wickedness, but they confirm in me a determination of not creating you a companion in vice. Shall I, in cold blood, set loose upon the earth a demon whose delight is in death and wretchedness? Be gone! I am firm, and your words only exasperate my rage. The monster saw my determination in my face, and gnashed his teeth in the impotence of anger. Shall each man, cried he, find a wife for his bosom, and each beast have his mate, and I be alone? I had feelings of affection, and they were requited by detestation and scorn. Man, you may hate, but beware. 
your hours will pass in dread and misery, and soon the bolt will fall which must ravage you from your happiness for ever. Are you to be happy while I grovel in the intensity of my wretchedness? You can blast my other passions, but revenge remains. Revenge, henceforth dearer than light or food. I may die, but first you, my tyrant and tormentor, shall curse the sun that gazes on your misery. Beware, for I am fearless and therefore powerful. I will watch with the wiliness of a snake, that I may sting with its venom. Man, you shall repent of the injuries you inflict. Devil, cease, and do not poison the air with these sounds of malice. I have declared my resolution to you, and I am no coward to bend beneath words. Leave me, I am inexorable. It is well, I go. But remember, I shall be with you on your wedding night. I started forward and exclaimed, Villain, before you sign my death warrant, be sure that you yourself are safe. I would have seized him, but he eluded me and quitted the house with precipitation. In a few moments I saw him in his boat, which shot across the waters with an arrowy swiftness, and was soon lost amidst the waves. All was again silent, but his words rang in my ears. I burned with rage to pursue the murderer of my peace and precipitate him into the ocean. I walked up and down my room hastily and perturbed, while my imagination conjured up a thousand images to torment and sting me. Why had I not followed him and closed with him in mortal strife? But I had suffered him to depart, and he had directed his course towards the mainland. I shuddered to think who might be the next victim, sacrificed to his insatiate revenge. And then I thought again of his words, I will be with you on your wedding night. That then was the period fixed for the fulfilment of my destiny. In that hour, I should die and at once satisfy and extinguish his malice. The prospect did not move me to fear, yet when I thought of my beloved Elizabeth, of her tears and endless sorrow, when she should find her lover so barbarously snatched from her, tears, the first I had shed for many months, streamed from my eyes, and I resolved not to fall before my enemy without a bitter struggle. The night passed away, and the sun rose from the ocean. My feelings became calmer, if it may be called calmness when the violence of rage sinks into the depths of despair. I left the house, the horrid scene of last night's contention, and walked on the beach of the sea, which I almost regarded as an insuperable barrier between me and my fellow creatures. Nay, a wish that such should prove the fact stole across me. I desired that I might pass my life on that barren rock, wearily, it is true, but uninterrupted by any sudden shock of misery. If I returned, it was to be sacrificed, or to see those whom I love most die under the grasp of a demon whom I had myself created. I walked about the aisle like a restless spectre, separated from all it loved and miserable in the separation. When it became noon and the sun rose higher, I lay down on the grass and was overpowered by a deep sleep. I had been awake the whole of the preceding night, my nerves were agitated, and my eyes inflamed by watching and misery. The sleep into which I now sank refreshed me, and when I awoke, I again felt as if I belonged to a race of human beings like myself, and I began to reflect upon what had passed with greater composure. Yet still, 
The words of the fiend rang in my ears like a death knell. They appeared like a dream, yet distinct and oppressive as a reality. The sun had far descended, and I sat still on the shore, satisfying my appetite, which had become ravenous, with an oaten cake, when I saw a fishing boat land close to me, and one of the men brought me a packet. It contained letters from Geneva and one from Clerval entreating me to join him. He said that he was wearing away his time fruitlessly where he was, that the letters from the friends he had formed in London desired his return to complete the negotiation they had entered into for his Indian enterprise. I could no longer delay his departure, but as his journey to London might be followed, even sooner than he now conjectured, by his longer voyage, he entreated me to bestow as much of my society on him as I could spare. He besought me, therefore, to leave my solitary isle and to meet him at Perth, that we might proceed southwards together. This letter in a degree recalled me to life, and I determined to quit my island at the expiration of two days. Yet before I departed, there was a task to perform, on which I shuddered to reflect. I must pack up my chemical instruments, and for that purpose I must enter the room which had been the scene of my odious work, and I must handle those utensils, the sight of which was sickening to me. The next morning, at daybreak, I summoned sufficient courage and unlocked the door of my laboratory. The remains of the half-finished creature whom I had destroyed, laid scattered on the floor, and I almost felt as if I had mingled with the living flesh of a human being. I paused to collect myself, and then entered the chamber. With trembling hand, I conveyed the instruments out of the room, but I reflected that I ought not to leave the relics of my work to excite the horror and suspicion of the peasants, and I accordingly put them into a basket with a great quantity of stones, and laying them up, determined to throw them into the sea that very night. And in the meantime I sat upon the beach, employed in cleaning and arranging my chemical apparatus. Nothing could be more complete than the alteration that had taken place in my feelings since the night of the appearance of the demon. I had before regarded my promise with gloomy despair as a thing that, with whatever consequences, must be fulfilled. But now I felt as if a film had been taken from before my eyes and that I saw for the first time clearly. The idea of renewing my labours did not for one instant occur to me. The threat I had weighed upon my thoughts but I did not reflect that a voluntary act of mine could avert it. I had resolved in my own mind that to create another like the fiend I had first made would be an act of the basest and most atrocious selfishness, and I banished from my mind every thought that could lead to a different conclusion. Between two and three in the morning the moon rose, and I then, putting my basket aboard a little skiff, sailed out about four miles from the shore. The scene was perfectly solitary. A few boats were returning towards land, but I sailed away from them. I felt as if I was about the commission of a dreadful crime, and avoided with shuddering anxiety any encounter with my fellow creatures. At one time the moon, which had been before clear, was suddenly overspread by a thick cloud and I took advantage of the moment of darkness and cast my basket into the sea. I listened to the gurgling sound as it sank and then sailed away from the spot. The sky became clouded, but the air was pure, although chilled by the northeast breeze that was then rising. But it refreshed me and filled me with such agreeable sensations that I resolved to prolong my stay on the water and fixing the rudder in a direct position, stretched myself at the bottom of the boat. Clouds hid the moon, everything was obscure, and I heard only the sound of the boat as its keel cut through the waves. The murmur lulled me, 
and in a short time I slept soundly. I do not know how long I remained in this situation, but when I awoke I found that the sun had already mounted considerably. The wind was high, and the waves continually threatened the safety of my little skiff. I found the wind was northeast and must have driven me far from the coast from which I had embarked. I endeavoured to change my course, but quickly found that if I again made the attempt, the boat would instantly filled with water. Thus situated, my only resource was to drive before the wind. I confess that I felt a few sensations of terror. I had no compass with me, and was so slenderly acquainted with the geography of this part of the world that the sun was of little benefit to me. I might be driven into the wild Atlantic and feel all the tortures of starvation, or be swallowed up in the immeasurable waters that roared and buffeted around me. I had already been out many hours and felt the torment of a burning thirst, a prelude to my other sufferings. I looked upon the heavens, which were covered by clouds that flew before the wind, only to be replaced by others. I looked upon the sea. It was to be my grave. Fiend! I exclaimed. Your task is already fulfilled. I thought of Elizabeth, of my father, and of Clerval, all left behind, on whom the monster might satisfy his sanguinary and merciless passions. This idea plunged me into a reverie so despairing and frightful that even now, when the scene is on the point of closing before me for ever, I shudder to reflect on it. Some hours passed thus, but by degrees, as the sun declined towards the horizon, the wind died away into a gentle breeze, and the sea became free from breakers. But these gave place to a heavy swell. I felt sick and hardly able to hold the rudder, when suddenly I saw a line of high land towards the south. Almost spent as I was, by fatigue and the dreadful suspense I had endured for several hours, this sudden certainty of life rushed like a flood of warm joy to my heart, and tears gushed from my eyes. How mutable are our feelings, and how strange it is that the clinging love we have of life, even in the excess of misery! I constructed another sail with a part of my dress, and eagerly steered my course towards the land. It had a wild and rocky appearance, but as I approached nearer I easily perceived the traces of cultivation. I saw vessels near the shore, and found myself suddenly transported back to the neighbourhood of civilised man. I carefully traced the windings of the land, and hailed a steeple at which I at length saw issuing from behind a small promontory. As I was in a state of extreme debility, I resolved to sail towards the town as a place where I could most easily procure nourishment. Fortunately, I had money with me. As I turned the promontory, I perceived a small neat town and a good harbour, which I entered, my heart bounding with joy at my unexpected escape. As I was occupied in fixing the boat and arranging the sails, several people crowded towards the spot. They seemed much surprised at my appearance, but, instead of offering me any assistance, whispered together with gestures that, at any other time, might have produced in me a slight sensation of alarm. As it was, I merely remarked that they spoke English, and I therefore addressed them in that language. My good friends, said I, will you be so kind as to tell me the name of this town, and inform me where I am? You will know that soon enough, replied a man with a hoarse voice. Maybe you come to a place that will not prove much to your taste, but you will not be consulted as to your quarters, I promise you. I was exceedingly surprised on receiving so rude an answer from a stranger, and I was also disconcerted on the perceiving the frowning and angry countenances of his companions. Why do you answer me so roughly? I replied. Surely it is not the custom of Englishmen to receive strangers so inhospitably. I do not know, 
said the man, what the custom of the English may be, but it is the custom of the Irish to hate villains. While this strange dialogue continued, I perceived the crowd in rapidly increase. Their faces expressed a mixture of curiosity and anger, which annoyed, and in some degree, alarmed me. I inquired the way to the inn, but no one replied. I then moved forward, and a murmuring sound arose from the crowd as they followed and surrounded me, when an ill-looking man approaching tapped me on the shoulder and said, Come, sir, you must follow me to Mr. Kerwin's to give an account of yourself. Who is Mr. Kerwin? Why am I to give an account of myself? Is this not a free country? Aye, sir, free enough for honest folks. Mr. Kerwin is a magistrate, and you are to give an account of the death of a gentleman who was found murdered here last night. This answer startled me, but I presently recovered myself. I was innocent. That could easily be proved. Accordingly, I followed my conductor in silence, and was led to one of the best houses in the town. I was ready to sink from fatigue and hunger, but being surrounded by a crowd, I thought it politic to rouse all my strength, so that no physical debility might be construed into apprehension or conscious guilt. Little did I then expect the calamity that was in a few moments to overwhelm me and extinguish in horror and despair all fear of ignominy or death. I might pause here, for it requires all my fortitude to recall the memory of the frightful events which I am about to relate in proper detail to my recollection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. This recording by Mark Bradford. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Chapter 21. I was soon introduced into the presence of the magistrate, an old benevolent man with calm and mild manners. He looked upon me, however, with some degree of severity, and then, turning towards my conductors, he asked who appeared as witnesses on this occasion. About half a dozen men came forward, and, one being selected by the magistrate, he deposed that he had been out fishing the night before with his son and brother-in-law, Daniel Nugent, when, about ten o'clock, they observed a strong northerly blast rising, and they accordingly put in for port. It was a very dark night, as the moon had not yet risen. They did not land at the harbour, but, as they had been accustomed, at a creek about two miles below. He walked on first, carrying a part of the fishing tackle, and his companions followed him at some distance. As he was proceeding along the sands, he struck his foot against something, and fell at his length on the ground. His companions came up to assist him, and by the light of their lantern they found that he had fallen on the body of a man, who was, to all appearance, dead. Their first supposition was that it was the corpse of some person who had been drowned and was thrown on shore by the waves, but on examination they found that the clothes were not wet and even that the body was not then cold. They instantly carried it to the cottage of an old woman near the spot and endeavoured, but in vain, to restore it to life. It appeared to be a handsome young man, about five and twenty years of age. He had apparently been strangled for there was no sign of any violence except the black mark of fingers on his neck. The first part of this deposition did not in the least interest me, but when the mark of the fingers was mentioned, I remembered the murder of my brother, and felt myself extremely agitated. My limbs trembled, and a mist came over my eyes, which obliged me to lean on a chair for support. The magistrate observed me with a keen eye, and of course drew an unfavorable augury from my manner. The son confirmed his father's account, but when Daniel Nugent was called, he swore positively that just before the fall of his companion, he saw a boat, with a single man in it, at a short distance from the shore, and as far as he could judge by the light of a few stars, it was the same boat in which I had just landed. 
a woman deposed that she lived near the beach, and was standing at the door of her cottage, waiting for the return of the fisherman, about an hour before she heard of the discovery of the body, when she saw a boat with only one man in it push off from that part of the shore where the corpse was afterwards found. Another woman confirmed the account of the fisherman having brought the body into her house. It was not cold. They put it into a bed and rubbed it, and Daniel went to the town for an apothecary, but life was quite gone. Several other men were examined concerning my landing, and they agreed that, with the strong north wind that had arisen during the night, it was very probable that I had beaten about for many hours and had been obliged to return nearly to the same spot from which I had departed. Besides, they observed that it appeared that I had brought the body from another place, and it was likely that as I did not appear to know the shore, I might have put into the harbour, ignorant of the distance of the town of Blank, from the place where I had deposited the corpse. Mr. Kerwin, on hearing this evidence, desired that I should be taken into the room where the body lay for interment, that it might be observed what effect the sight of it would produce upon me. This idea was probably suggested by the extreme agitation I had exhibited when the mode of the murder had been described. I was accordingly conducted, by the magistrate and several other persons, to the inn. I could not help being struck by the strange coincidences that had taken place during this eventful night, but, knowing that I had been conversing with several persons in the island I had inhabited about the time that the body had been found, I was perfectly tranquil as to the consequences of the affair. I entered the room where the corpse lay, and was led up to the coffin. How can I describe my sensations on beholding it? I feel yet parched with horror, nor can I reflect on that terrible moment without shuddering and agony. The examination, the presence of the magistrate and witnesses, passed like a dream from my memory when I saw the lifeless form of Henry Clerval stretched before me. I gasped for breath, and throwing myself on the body, I exclaimed, have my murderous machinations deprived you also, my dearest Henry, of life? Two I have already destroyed. Other victims await their destiny. But you, Clerval, my friend, my benefactor. The human frame could no longer support the agonies that I endured, and I was carried out of the room in strong convulsions. A fever succeeded to this. I lay for two months on the point of death. My ravings, as I afterward heard, were frightful. I called myself the murderer of William, of Justine, and of Clerval. Sometimes I entreated my attendants to assist me in the destruction of the fiend by whom I was tormented, and at others I felt the fingers of the monster already grasping my neck, and screamed aloud with agony and terror. Fortunately, as I spoke my native language, Mr. Kerwin alone understood me, but my gestures and bitter cries were sufficient to affright the other witnesses. Why did I not die? more miserable than man ever was before, why did I not sink into forgetfulness and rest? Death snatches away many blooming children, the only hopes of their doting parents. How many brides and youthful lovers have been one day in the bloom of health and hope, and the next a prey for worms and the decay of the tomb? Of what materials was I made, that I could thus resist so many shocks, which, like the turning of the wheel, continually renewed the torture? But I was doomed to live, and in two months found myself as awaking from a dream, in a prison, stretched on a wretched bed, surrounded by jailers, turnkeys, bolts, and all the miserable apparatus of a dungeon. It was morning, I remember, when I thus awoke to understanding. I had forgotten the particulars of what had happened, and only felt as if some great misfortune had suddenly overwhelmed me. But when I looked around and saw the barred windows and the squalidness of the room in which I was, all flashed across my memory, and I groaned bitterly. This sound disturbed an old woman who was sleeping in a chair beside me. She was a hired nurse, the wife of one of the turnkeys, and her countenance expressed all those bad qualities which often characterize that class. The lines of her face were hard and rude, like that of persons accustomed to see without sympathizing in sights of misery. Her tone expressed her entire indifference, she addressed me in English, and the voice struck me as one that I had heard during my sufferings. "'Are you better now, sir?' said she. I replied in the same language, with a feeble voice, "'I believe I am, but if it be all true, if indeed I did not dream, I am sorry that I am still alive to feel this misery and horror.' 
"'For that matter,' replied the old woman, "'if you mean about the gentleman you murdered, "'I believe that it were better for you if you were dead, "'for I fancy it will go hard with you. "'However, that's none of my business. "'I am sent to nurse you and get you well. "'I do my duty with a safe conscience. "'It were well if everybody did the same.' I turned with loathing from the woman who could utter so unfeeling a speech to a person just saved, on the very edge of death, but I felt languid and unable to reflect on all that had passed. The whole series of my life appeared to me as a dream. I sometimes doubted if indeed it were all true, for it never presented itself to my mind with the force of reality. As the images that floated before me became more distinct, I grew feverish. A darkness pressed around me. No one was near me who soothed me with the gentle voice of love. No dear hand supported me. The physician came and prescribed medicines, and the old woman prepared them for me. But utter carelessness was visible in the first, and the expression of brutality was strongly marked in the visage of the second. Who could be interested in the fate of a murderer but the hangman who would gain his fee? These were my first reflections, but I soon learned that Mr. Kerwin had shown me extreme kindness. He had caused the best room in the prison to be prepared for me, wretched indeed was the best, and it was he who had provided a physician and a nurse. It is true he seldom came to see me, for although he ardently desired to relieve the sufferings of every human creature, he did not wish to be present at the agonies and miserable ravings of a murderer. He came, therefore, sometimes to see that I was not neglected, but his visits were short and with long intervals. One day, while I was gradually recovering, I was seated in a chair, my eyes half open and my cheeks livid like those in death. I was overcome by gloom and misery, and often reflected I had better seek death than desire to remain in a world which to me was replete with wretchedness. At one time I considered whether I should not declare myself guilty and suffer the penalty of the law, less innocent than poor Justine had been. Such were my thoughts when the door of my apartment was opened and Mr. Kerwin entered. His countenance expressed sympathy and compassion. He drew a chair close to mine, and addressed me in French. I fear that this place is very shocking to you. Can I do anything to make you more comfortable? I thank you, but all that you mention is nothing to me. On the whole earth there is no comfort which I am capable of receiving. I know that the sympathy of a stranger can be of but of little relief to one borne down as you are by so strange a misfortune. But you will, I hope, soon quit this melancholy abode, for doubtless evidence can easily be brought to free you from the criminal charge. That is my least concern. I am, by a course of strange events, become the most miserable of mortals. Persecuted and tortured as I am and have been, can death be any evil to me? Nothing indeed could be more unfortunate and agonizing than the strange chances that have lately occurred. You were thrown by some surprising accident on this shore, renowned for its hospitality, seized immediately, and charged with murder. The first sight that was presented to your eyes was the body of your friend, murdered in so unaccountable a manner, and placed, as it were, by some fiend across your path. As Mr. Kerwin said this, notwithstanding the agitation I endured on this retrospect of my sufferings, I also felt considerable surprise at the knowledge he seemed to possess concerning me. I suppose some astonishment was exhibited in my countenance, for Mr. Kerwin hastened to say, Immediately upon your being taken ill, all the papers that were on your person were brought to me, and I examined them that I might discover some trace by which I could send to your relations an account of your misfortune and illness. I found several letters, and among others, one which I discovered from its commencement to be from your father. I instantly wrote to Geneva. Nearly two months have elapsed since the departure of my letter. But you are ill. Even now you tremble. You are unfit for agitation of any kind." The suspense is a thousand times worse than the most horrible event. Tell me what new scene of death has been acted, and whose murder I am now to lament. Your family is perfectly well, said Mr. Kerwin, with gentleness. And someone, a friend, is come to visit you. I know not by what chain of thought the idea presented itself, but it instantly darted into my mind that the murderer had come to mock at my misery and taunt me with the death of Clerval as a new incitement for me to comply with his hellish desires. I put my hand before my eyes and cried out in agony, Oh, take him away! I cannot see him! For God's sake, do not let him enter! Mr. Kerwin regarded me with a troubled countenance. He could not help regarding my exclamation as a presumption of my guilt, and said in rather a severe tone, 
I should have thought, young man, that the presence of your father would have been welcome instead of inspiring such violent repugnance. My father, cried I, while every feature and every muscle was relaxed from anguish to pleasure. Is my father indeed come? How kind, how very kind! But where is he? Why does he not hasten to me? My change of manner surprised and pleased the magistrate. Perhaps he thought that my former exclamation was a momentary return of delirium, and now he instantly resumed his former benevolence. He rose and quitted the room with my nurse, and in a moment my father entered it. Nothing at this moment could have given me greater pleasure than the arrival of my father. I stretched out my hand to him and cried, Are you then safe, and Elizabeth, and Ernest? My father calmed me with assurances of their welfare, and endeavoured, by dwelling on these subjects so interesting to my heart, to raise my desponding spirits. But he soon felt that a prison cannot be the abode of cheerfulness. "'What a place is this that you inhabit, my son?' said he, looking mournfully at the barred windows and wretched appearance of the room. "'You travel to seek happiness, but a fatality seems to pursue you. And poor Clerval!' The name of my unfortunate and murdered friend was an agitation too great to be endured in my weak state. I shed tears. "'Alas! yes, my father,' replied I. "'Some destiny of the most horrible kind hangs over me, and I must live to fulfil it, or surely I should have died on the coffin of Henry.' We were not allowed to converse for any length of time, for the precarious state of my health rendered every precaution necessary that could ensure tranquillity. Mr. Kerwin came in and insisted that my strength should not be exhausted by too much exertion, but the appearance of my father was to me like that of my good angel, and I gradually recovered my health. As my sickness quitted me, I was absorbed by a gloomy and black melancholy that nothing could dissipate. The image of Clerval was forever before me, ghastly and murdered. More than once the agitation into which these reflections threw me made my friends dread a dangerous relapse. Alas, why did they preserve so miserable and detested a life? It was surely that I might fulfill my destiny, which is now drawing to a close. Soon, oh, very soon, will death extinguish these throbbings and relieve me from the mighty weight of anguish that bears me to the dust, and, in executing the award of justice, I shall also sink to rest. Then the appearance of death was distant, although the wish was ever present to my thoughts and I often sat for hours motionless and speechless, wishing for some mighty revolution that might bury me and my destroyer in its ruins. The season of the Assizes approached. I had already been three months in prison, and although I was still weak and in continual danger of a relapse, I was obliged to travel nearly a hundred miles to the country town where the court was held. Mr. Kerwin charged himself with every care of collecting witnesses and arranging my defense. I was spared the disgrace of appearing publicly as a criminal, as the case was not brought before the court that decides on life and death. The grand jury rejected the bill, on its being proved that I was on the Orkney Islands at the hour the body of my friend was found, and a fortnight after my removal I was liberated from prison. My father was enraptured on finding me freed from the vexations of a criminal charge, that I was again allowed to breathe the fresh atmosphere and permitted to return to my native country. I did not participate in these feelings, for to me the walls of a dungeon or a palace were alike hateful. The cup of life was poisoned for ever, and although the sun shone upon me, as upon the happy and gay of heart, I saw around me nothing but a dense and frightful darkness, penetrated by no light but the glimmer of two eyes that glared upon me. Sometimes they were the expressive eyes of Henry, languishing in death, the dark orbs nearly covered by the lids and the long black lashes that fringed them. Sometimes it was the watery, clouded eyes of the monster, as I first saw them in my chamber at Ingolstadt. My father tried to awaken in me the feelings of affection. He talked of Geneva, which I should soon visit, of Elizabeth and Ernest, but these words only drew deep groans from me. Sometimes, indeed, I felt a wish for happiness, and thought with melancholy delight of my beloved cousin, or longed, with a devouring malady du pays, to see once more the blue lake and rapid Rhone that had been so dear to me in early childhood. But my general state of feeling was a torpor, in which a prison was as welcome a residence as the divinest scene in nature, and these fits were seldom interrupted but by paroxysms of anguish and despair. 
At these moments I often endeavoured to put an end to the existence I loathed, and it required unceasing attendance and vigilance to restrain me from committing some dreadful act of violence. Yet one duty remained to me, the recollection of which finally triumphed over my selfish despair. It was necessary that I should return without delay to Geneva, there to watch over the lives of those I so fondly loved, and to lie in wait for the murderer, that if any chance led me to the place of his concealment, or if he dared again to blast me by his presence, I might, with unfailing aim, put an end to the existence of the monstrous image which I had endued with the mockery of a soul still more monstrous. My father still desired to delay our departure, fearful that I could not sustain the fatigues of a journey, for I was a shattered wreck, the shadow of a human being. My strength was gone, I was a mere skeleton, and fever night and day preyed upon my wasted frame. Still, as I urged our leaving Ireland with such inquietude and impatience, my father thought it best to yield. We took our passage on board a vessel bound for Havre de Grasse, and sailed with a fair wind from the Irish shores. It was midnight. I lay on the deck, looking at the stars and listening to the dashing of the waves. I hailed the darkness that shut Ireland from my sight, and my pulse beat with a feverish joy when I reflected that I should soon see Geneva. The past appeared to me in the light of a frightful dream, yet the vessel in which I was, the wind that blew me from the detested shore of Ireland, and the sea which surrounded me told me too forcibly that I was deceived by no vision, and that Clerval, my friend and dearest companion, had fallen a victim to me and the monster of my creation. I repassed in my memory my whole life, my quiet happiness while residing with my family in Geneva, the death of my mother, and my departure for Ingolstadt. I remembered, shuddering, the mad enthusiasm that hurried me on to the creation of my hideous enemy, and I called to mind the night in which he first lived. I was unable to pursue the train of thought. A thousand feelings pressed upon me, and I wept bitterly. Ever since my recovery from the fever, I had been in the custom of taking every night a small quantity of laudanum, for it was by means of this drug only that I was enabled to gain the rest necessary for the preservation of life. Oppressed by the recollection of my various misfortunes, I now swallowed double my usual quantity, and soon slept profoundly. But sleep did not afford me respite from thought and misery. My dreams presented a thousand objects that scared me. Towards morning I was possessed by a kind of nightmare. I felt the fiend's grasp in my neck, and could not free myself from it. Groans and cries rang in my ears. My father, who was watching over me, perceiving my restlessness, awoke me. The dashing waves were around, the cloudy sky above, the fiend was not here. A sense of security, a feeling that a truce was established between the present hour and the irresistible disastrous future, imparted to me a kind of calm forgetfulness, of which the human mind is by its structure peculiarly susceptible. Chapter 22 The voyage came to an end. We landed and proceeded to Paris. I soon found that I had overtaxed my strength, and that I must repose before I could continue my journey. My father's care and attentions were indefatigable, but he did not know the origin of my sufferings, and sought erroneous methods to remedy the incurable ill. He wished me to seek amusement in society. I abhorred the face of man. Oh, not abhorred! They were my brethren, my fellow beings, and I felt attracted to even the most repulsive among them, as to creatures of an angelic nature and celestial mechanism. But I felt that I had no right to share their intercourse. I had unchained an enemy among them, whose joy it was to shed their blood and to revel in their groans. How they would, each and all, abhor me and hunt me from the world, did they know my unhallowed acts and the crimes which had their source in me. My father yielded at length to my desire to avoid society, and strove by various arguments to banish my despair. Sometimes he thought that I felt deeply the degradation of being obliged to answer a charge of murder, and he endeavoured to prove to me the futility of pride. "'Alas, my father,' said I, "'how little do you know me! Human beings, their feelings and passions, would indeed be degraded if such a wretch as I felt pride.' Justine, poor unhappy Justine, was as innocent as I, and she suffered the same charge. She died for it, and I am the cause of this. I murdered her. William, Justine, and Henry, they all died by my hands. 
my father had often, during my imprisonment, heard me make the same assertion. When I thus accused myself, he sometimes seemed to desire an explanation, and at others he appeared to consider it as the offspring of delirium, and that, during my illness, some idea of this kind had presented itself to my imagination, the remembrance of which I preserved in my convalescence. I avoided explanation, and maintained a continual silence concerning the wretch I had created. I had a persuasion that I should be supposed mad, and this in itself would forever have chained my tongue. But, besides, I could not bring myself to disclose a secret which would fill my hearer with consternation, and make fear and unnatural horror the inmates of his breast. I checked, therefore, my impatient thirst for sympathy, and was silent when I would have given the world to have confided the fatal secret. Yet still, words like those I have recorded would burst uncontrollably from me. I could offer no explanation of them, but their truth in part relieved the burden of my mysterious woe. Upon this occasion my father said, with an expression of unbounded wonder, My dearest Victor, what infatuation is this? My dear son, I entreat you never to make such an assertion again. I am not mad, I cried energetically. The sun and the heavens which have viewed my operations can bear witness of my truth. I am the assassin of those most innocent victims. They died by my machinations. A thousand times would I have shed my own blood, drop by drop, to have saved their lives. But I could not, my father, indeed I could not sacrifice the whole human race. The conclusion of this speech convinced my father that my ideas were deranged, and he instantly changed the subject of our conversation and endeavored to alter the course of my thoughts. He wished, as much as possible, to obliterate the memory of the scenes that had taken place in Ireland, and never alluded to them or suffered me to speak of my misfortunes. As time passed away I became more calm. Misery had her dwelling in my heart, but I no longer talked in the same incoherent manner of my own crimes. Sufficient for me was the consciousness of them. By the utmost self-violence I curbed the imperious voice of wretchedness, which sometimes desired to declare itself to the whole world, and my manners were calmer and more composed than they had ever been since my journey to the Sea of Ice. A few days before we left Paris on our way to Switzerland, I received the following letter from Elizabeth. My dear friend, it gave me the greatest pleasure to receive a letter from my uncle dated at Paris. You are no longer at a formidable distance, and I may hope to see you in less than a fortnight. My poor cousin, how much you must have suffered! I expect to see you looking even more ill than when you quitted Geneva. This winter has been passed most miserably, tortured as I have been by anxious suspense. Yet I hope to see peace in your countenance, and to find that your heart is not totally void of comfort and tranquillity. Yet I fear that the same feelings now exist that made you so miserable a year ago, even perhaps augmented by time. I would not disturb you at this period, when so many misfortunes weigh upon you, but a conversation that I had with my uncle, previous to his departure, renders some explanation necessary before we meet. Explanation? You may possibly say, what can Elizabeth have to explain? If you really say this, my questions are answered, and all my doubts satisfied. But you are distant from me, and it is possible that you may dread and yet be pleased with this explanation. And in a probability of this being the case, I dare not any longer postpone writing what, during your absence, I have often wished to express to you, but have never had the courage to begin. You well know, Victor, that our union had been the favorite plan of your parents ever since our infancy. We were told this when young, and taught to look forward to it as an event that would certainly take place. We were affectionate playfellows during childhood, and, I believe, dear and valued friends to one another as we grew older. But as brother and sister often entertain a lively affection towards each other without desiring a more intimate union, may not such also be our case? Tell me, dearest Victor. Answer me, I conjure you by our mutual happiness with simple truth. Do you not love another? You have travelled, you have spent several years of your life at Ingolstadt, and I confess to you, my friend, that when I saw you last autumn so unhappy, flying to solitude from the society of every creature, I could not help supposing that you might regret our connection, and believe yourself bound in honour to fulfil the wishes of your parents, although they opposed themselves to your inclinations. But this is false reasoning. I confess to you, my friend, that I love you, and that in my airy dreams of futurity you have been my constant friend and companion. But it is your happiness I desire, as well as my own, when I declare to you that our marriage would render me eternally miserable unless it were the dictate of your own free choice. 
Even now I weep to think that, borne down as you are by the cruelest misfortunes, you may stifle, by the word honour, all hope of that love and happiness which would alone restore you to yourself. I, who have so disinterested an affection for you, may increase your miseries tenfold by being an obstacle to your wishes. Ah, Victor, be assured that your cousin and playmate has too sincere a love for you not to be made miserable by this supposition. Be happy, my friend, and if you obey me in this one request, remain satisfied that nothing on earth will have the power to interrupt my tranquillity. Do not let this letter disturb you. Do not answer to-morrow, or the next day, or even until you come, if it will give you pain. My uncle will send me news of your health, and if I see but one smile on your lips when we meet, occasioned by this or any other exertion of mine, I shall need no other happiness. Elizabeth Lavenza, Geneva, May 18th, 17 blank. This letter revived in my memory what I had before forgotten, the threat of the fiend. I will be with you on your wedding night. Such was my sentence, and on that night would the demon employ every art to destroy me and tear me from the glimpse of happiness which promised partly to console my sufferings. On that night he had determined to consummate his crimes by my death. Well, be it so. A deadly struggle would then assuredly take place, in which if he were victorious, I should be at peace, and his power over me be at an end. If he were vanquished, I should be a free man. Alas! What freedom! Such as the peasant enjoys when his family have been massacred before his eyes, his cottage burnt, his lands laid waste, and he is turned adrift, homeless, penniless, and alone, but free. Such would be my liberty, except that in my Elizabeth I possessed a treasure, alas, balanced by those horrors of remorse and guilt which would pursue me until death. Sweet and beloved Elizabeth, I read and re-read her letter, and some softened feelings stole into my heart, and dared to whisper paradisiacal dreams of love and joy. But the apple was already eaten, and the angel's arm bared to drive me from all hope. Yet I would die to make her happy. If the monster executed his threat, death was inevitable. Yet, again, I considered whether my marriage would hasten my fate. My destruction might indeed arrive a few months sooner, but if my torturer should suspect that I postponed it, influenced by his menaces, he would surely find other and perhaps more dreadful means of revenge. He had vowed to be with me on my wedding night, yet he did not consider that threat as binding him to peace in the meantime, for as if to show me that he was not yet satiated with blood, he had murdered Clerval immediately after the enunciation of his threats. I resolved, therefore, that if my immediate union with my cousin would conduce either to hers or my father's happiness, my adversary's designs against my life should not retard it a single hour. In this state of mind I wrote to Elizabeth. My letter was calm and affectionate. I fear, my beloved girl, I said, little happiness remains for us on earth, yet all that I may one day enjoy is centered in you. Chase away your idle fears. To you alone do I consecrate my life and my endeavors for contentment. I have one secret, Elizabeth, a dreadful one. When revealed to you it will chill your frame with horror, and then, far from being surprised at my misery, you will only wonder that I survive what I have endured. I will confide this tale of misery and terror to you the day after our marriage shall take place. For, my sweet cousin, there must be perfect confidence between us. But until then, I conjure you, do not mention or allude to it. This I most earnestly entreat, and I know you will comply. In about a week after the arrival of Elizabeth's letter, we returned to Geneva. The sweet girl welcomed me with warm affection, yet tears were in her eyes as she beheld my emaciated frame and feverish cheeks. I saw a change in her also. She was thinner and had lost much of that heavenly vivacity that had before charmed me, but her gentleness and soft looks of compassion made her a more fit companion for one blasted and miserable as I was. The tranquillity which I now enjoy did not endure. Memory brought madness with it, and when I thought of what had passed, a real insanity possessed me. Sometimes I was furious and burnt with rage, sometimes low and despondent. I neither spoke nor looked at any one but sat motionless, bewildered by the multitude of miseries that overcame me. 
Elizabeth alone had the power to draw me from these fits. Her gentle voice would soothe me when transported by passion, and inspire me with human feelings when sunk in torpor. She wept with me and for me. When reason returned, she would remonstrate and endeavor to inspire me with resignation. Ah, it is well for the unfortunate to be resigned, but for the guilty there is no peace. The agonies of remorse poison the luxury there is otherwise sometimes found in indulging the excess of grief. Soon after my arrival my father spoke of my immediate marriage with Elizabeth. I remained silent. Have you then some other attachment? None on earth. I love Elizabeth and look forward to our union with delight. Let the day therefore be fixed, and on it I will consecrate myself, in life or death, to the happiness of my cousin. My dear Victor, do not speak thus. Heavy misfortunes have befallen us, but let us only cling closer to what remains, and transfer our love for those whom we have lost to those who yet live. Our circle will be small, but bound close by the ties of affection and mutual misfortune, and when time shall have softened your despair, new and dear objects of care will be born to replace those of whom we have been so cruelly deprived. Such were the lessons of my father. But to me the remembrance of the threat returned. Nor can you wonder that, omnipotent as the fiend had yet been in his deeds of blood, I should almost regard him as invincible, and that when he had pronounced the words, I shall be with you on your wedding night, I should regard the threatened fate as unavoidable. But death was no evil to me if the loss of Elizabeth were balanced with it, and I therefore, with a contented and even cheerful countenance, agreed with my father that if my cousin would consent, the ceremony should take place in ten days, and thus put, as I imagined, the seal to my fate. Great God! If for one instant I had thought what might be the hellish intention of my fiendish adversary, I would rather have banished myself forever from my native country, and wandered a friendless outcast over the earth, than have consented to this miserable marriage. But, as if possessed of magic powers, the monster had blinded me to his real intentions, and when I thought that I had prepared only my own death, I hastened that of a far dearer victim. As the period fixed for our marriage drew nearer, whether from cowardice or a prophetic feeling, I felt my heart sink within me. But I concealed my feelings by an appearance of hilarity that brought smiles and joy to the countenance of my father, but hardly deceived the ever-watchful and nicer eye of Elizabeth. She looked forward to our union with placid contentment, not unmingled with a little fear, which past misfortunes had impressed that what now appeared certain and tangible happiness might soon dissipate into an airy dream and leave no trace but deep and everlasting regret. Preparations were made for the event, congratulatory visits were received, and all wore a smiling appearance. I shut up, as well as I could, in my own heart, the anxiety that preyed there, and entered with seeming earnestness into the plans of my father, although they might only serve as the decorations of my tragedy. Through my father's exertions a part of the inheritance of Elizabeth had been restored to her by the Austrian government. A small possession on the shores of Como belonged to her. It was agreed that, immediately after our union, we should proceed to Villa Lavenza and spend our first days of happiness beside the beautiful lake near which it stood. In the meantime I took every precaution to defend my person in case the fiend should openly attack me. I carried pistols and a dagger constantly about me, and was ever on the watch to prevent artifice, and by these means gained a greater degree of tranquillity. Indeed, as the period approached, the threat appeared more as a delusion, not to be regarded as worthy to disturb my peace, while the happiness I hoped for in my marriage wore a greater appearance of certainty, as the day fixed for its solemnization drew nearer, and I heard it continually spoken of as an occurrence which no accident could possibly prevent. Elizabeth seemed happy. My tranquil demeanor contributed greatly to calm her mind. But on the day that was to fulfill my wishes and my destiny, she was melancholy, and a presentiment of evil pervaded her and perhaps also she thought of the dreadful secret which I had promised to reveal to her on the following day. My father was in the meantime overjoyed, and in the bustle of preparation, only recognized in the melancholy of his niece the diffidence of a bride. After the ceremony was performed, a large party assembled at my father's, but it was agreed that Elizabeth and I should commence our journey by water, 
sleeping that night at Evian, and continuing our voyage on the following day. The day was fair, the wind favourable, all smiled on our nuptial embarkation. Those were the last moments of my life during which I enjoyed the feeling of happiness. We passed rapidly along, the sun was hot, but we were sheltered from its rays by a kind of canopy, while we enjoyed the beauty of the scene, sometimes on one side of the lake, where we saw Mount Saleve, the pleasant banks of Montalegre, and at a distance surmounting all, the beautiful Mont Blanc, and the assemblage of snowy mountains that in vain endeavoured to emulate her. Sometimes coasting the opposite banks we saw the mighty Jura, opposing its dark side to the ambition that would quit its native country, and an almost insurmountable barrier to the invader who should wish to enslave it. I took the hand of Elizabeth. You are sorrowful, my love. Ah, if you knew what I have suffered and what I may yet endure, you would endeavour to let me taste the quiet and freedom from despair that this one day at least permits me to enjoy. Be happy, my dear Victor, replied Elizabeth. There is, I hope, nothing to distress you, and be assured that if a lively joy is not painted in my face, my heart is contented. Something whispers to me not to depend too much on the prospect that is opened before us, but I will not listen to such a sinister voice. Observe how fast we move along, and how the clouds, which sometimes obscure and sometimes rise above the dome of Mont Blanc, render this scene of beauty still more interesting. Look also at the innumerable fish that are swimming in the clear waters, where we can distinguish every pebble that lies at the bottom. What a divine day! How happy and serene all nature appears! Thus Elizabeth endeavoured to divert her thoughts and mine from all reflection upon melancholy subjects. But her temper was fluctuating. Joy for a few instants shone in her eyes, but it continually gave place to distraction and reverie. The sun sank lower in the heavens. We passed the river Drance and observed its path through the chasms of the higher and the glens of the lower hills. The Alps here come closer to the lake, and we approached the amphitheatre of mountains which formed its eastern boundary. The spire of Evian shone under the woods that surrounded it, and the range of mountain above mountain by which it was overhung. The wind, which had hitherto carried us along with amazing rapidity, sank at sunset to a light breeze. The soft air just ruffled the water, and caused a pleasant motion among the trees as we approached the shore, from which it wafted the most delightful scent of flowers and hay. The sun sank beneath the horizon as we landed, and as I touched the shore I felt those cares and fears revive, which soon were to clasp me and cling to me forever. End of chapter 22 Recorded October 16, 2005, in Longmont, Colorado. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information, see LibriVox.blogsome.com. Today's recording by Hugh McGuire. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Chapter 23 It was eight o'clock when we landed. We walked for a short time on the shore, enjoying the transitory light, and then retired to the inn and contemplated the lovely scene of waters, woods and mountains, obscured in darkness yet still displaying their black outlines. The wind, which had fallen in the south, now rose with great violence in the west. The moon had reached her summit in the heavens and was beginning to descend. The clouds swept across it swifter than the flight of the vulture and dimmed her rays, while the lake reflected the scene of the busy heavens, rendered still busier by the restless waves that were beginning to rise. Suddenly a heavy storm of rain descended. I had been calm during the day, but so soon as night obscured the shapes of objects, a thousand fears rose in my mind. I was anxious and watchful, while my right hand grasped the pistol which was hidden in my bosom. Every sound terrified me, but I resolved that I would sell my life dearly and not shrink from the conflict until my own life or that of my adversary was extinguished. 
Elizabeth observed my agitation for some time in timid and fearful silence, but there was something in my glance which communicated terror to her, and trembling, she asked, What is it that agitates you, my dear Victor? What is it you fear? Oh, peace, peace, my love, I replied. This night, and all will be safe. But this night is dreadful, very dreadful. I passed an hour in this state of mind, when suddenly I reflected how fearful the combat which I momentarily expected would be to my wife, and earnestly I entreated her to retire, resolving not to join her until I had obtained some knowledge as to the situation of my enemy. She left me, and I continued some time walking up and down the passages of the house and inspecting every corner that might afford a retreat to my adversary. But I discovered no trace of him, and was beginning to conjecture that some fortunate chance had intervened to prevent the execution of his menaces, when suddenly I heard a shrill and dreadful scream. It came from the room into which Elizabeth had retired. As I heard it, the whole truth rushed into my mind. My arms dropped. The motion of every muscle and fiber was suspended. I could feel the blood trickling in my veins and tingling in the extremities of my limbs. The state lasted but for an instant. The scream was repeated, and I rushed into the room. Great God! Why did I not then expire? Why am I here to relate the destruction of the best hope and the purest creatures of earth? She was there, lifeless and inanimate, thrown across the bed, her head hanging down and her pale and distorted features half covered by her hair. Everywhere I turn I see the same figure, her bloodless arms and relaxed form, flung by the murderer on its bridal brier. Could I behold this and live? Alas, life is obstinate and clings closest where it is most hated. For a moment only did I lose recollection. I fell senseless on the ground. When I recovered, I found myself surrounded by the people of the inn. Their countenance expressed a breathless terror. But the horror of others appeared only as a mockery, a shadow of the feelings that oppressed me. I escaped from them to the room where lay the body of Elizabeth, my love, my wife, so lately living, so dear, so worthy. She had been moved from the posture in which I had first beheld her, and now, as she lay, her head upon her arms, and a handkerchief thrown across her face and neck, I might have supposed her asleep. I rushed, I rushed towards her and embraced her with ardor but the deadly languor and coldness of the limbs told me that what I now held in my arms had ceased to be the Elizabeth whom I had loved and cherished. The murderous mark of the fiend's grasp was on her neck, and the breath had ceased to issue from her lips. While I still hung over her in the agony of despair, I happened to look up. The windows of the room had before been darkened, and I felt a kind of panic on seeing the pale yellow light of the moon illuminate the chamber. The shutters had been thrown back, and, with a sensation of horror not to be described, I saw at the open window a figure the most hideous and abhorred. A grin was on the face of the monster. He seemed to jeer as with his fiendish finger he pointed towards the corpse of my wife. I rushed towards the window, and drawing pistol from my bosom, fired. But he eluded me, leapt from his station, and running with the swiftness of lightning, plunged into the lake. The report of the pistol brought a crowd into the room. I pointed to the spot where he had disappeared, and we followed the track with boats. Nets were cast, but in vain. After passing several hours, we returned hopeless, most of my companions believing it to have been a form conjured up by my fancy. After having landed, they proceeded to search the country, 
parties going in different directions among the woods and vines. I attempted to accompany them and proceed the short distance from the house, but my head whirled round, my steps were like those of a drunken man, and I felt at last in a state of utter exhaustion. A film covered my eyes and my skin was parched with the heat of fever. In this state I was carried back and placed on a bed, hardly conscious of what had happened. My eyes wandered round the room as if to seek something that I had lost. After an interval I rose and, as if by instinct, crawled into the room where the corpse of my beloved lay. There were women weeping around. I hung over it and joined my sad tears to theirs. All this time no distinct idea presented itself to my mind, but my thoughts rambled to their various subjects, reflecting confusedly on my misfortunes and their cause. I was bewildered in a cloud of wonder and horror. The death of William, the execution of Justine, the murder of Clerval, and lastly of my wife. Even at that moment I knew not that my only remaining friends were safe from the malignity of the fiend. My father, even now, might be writhing under his grasp, and Ernest might be dead at his feet. This idea made me shudder and recalled me to action. I started up and resol resolved to return to Geneva with all possible speed. There were no horses to be procured, and I must return by the lake. But the wind was unfavorable, and the rain fell in torrents. However, it was hardly morning, and I might reasonably hope to arrive by night. I hired men to row and took my oar myself, for I had always experienced relief from mental torment and bodily exercise. But the overflowing misery misery I now felt, and the excess of agitation that I endured, rendered me incapable of any exertion. I threw down the oar, and leaning my head upon my hands gave way to every gloomy idea that arose. If I looked up, I saw scenes which were familiar to me in my happier time, and which I had contemplated but the day before in the company of her who was now but a shadow and a recollection. Tears streamed from my eyes. The rain had ceased for a moment, and I saw the fish play in the waters as they had done a few hours before. They had then been observed by Elizabeth. Nothing is so painful to the human mind as a great and sudden change. The sun might shine or the crowds might lure, but nothing could appear to me as it had done the day before. A fiend had snatched from me every hope of future happiness. No creature had ever been so miserable as I was, so frightful an event is single in the history of man. But why should I dwell upon the incidents that followed this last overwhelming event? Mine has been a tale of horrors. I have reached their acme, and what I must now relate can be but tedious to you. Know that one by one my friends were snatched away. I was left desolate. My own strength is exhausted and I must tell in a few words what remains of my hideous narration. I arrived at Geneva. My father and Ernest yet lived, but the former sunk under the tidings that I bore. I see him now, excellent and venerable old man. His eyes wandered in vacancy, for they had lost their charm and their delight. His Elizabeth, his more than daughter, whom he doted on with all that affection which a man feels, who in the decline of life, having few affections, cling, clings more earnestly to those that remain. Cursed, cursed be the fiend that brought misery on his gray hairs and doomed him to waste in wretchedness. He could not live under the horrors that were accumulated around him. 
the springs of existence suddenly gave way. He was unable to live, rise from his bed, and in a few days he died in my arms. What then became of me? I know not. I lost sensation, and chains and darkness were the only objects that pressed upon me. Sometimes, indeed, I dreamt that I wandered in flowery meadows and pleasant vales with the friends of my youth, but I awoke and found myself in a dungeon. Melancholy followed, but by degrees I gained a clear conception of my miseries and situation, and was then released from my prison. For they had called me mad, and during many months, as I understood, a solitary cell had been my habitation. Liberty, however, had been a useless gift to me, had I not, as I awakened to reason, at the same time awakened to revenge. As the memory of my past misfortunes pressed upon me, I began to reflect on their cause. The monster whom I had created, the miserable demon whom I had sent abroad into the world for my destruction, I was possessed by a maddening rage when I thought of him, and desired and ardently prayed that I might have him within my grasp to wreak a great and signal, single revenge on his cursed head. Nor did my hate long confine itself to useless wishes. I began to reflect on the best means of securing him, and for this purpose, about a month after my release, I repaired to a criminal judge in town, and told him that I had an accusation to make, that I knew the destroyer of my family, and that I required him to exert his whole authority for the apprehension of the murderer. The magistrate listened to me with attention and kindness. Be assured, sir, he said, no pains or exertion on my part shall be spared to discover the villain. Thank you, I replied. Listen, therefore, to the deposition that I have to make. It is indeed a tale so strange that I should fear you would not credit it, were it not something in truth which, however wonderful, forces conviction. The story is too connected to be mistaken for a dream, and I have no motive for falsehood. My manner, as I thus addressed him, was impressive, but calm. I had formed in my own heart a resolution to pursue my destroyer to death, and this purpose quieted my agony, and for an interval reconciled me to life. I now relate my history briefly, but with firmness and precision, marking the dates with accuracy, and never deviating into invective or exclamation. The magistrate appeared at first perfectly incredulous, but as I continued he became more attentive and interested. I saw him sometimes shudder with horror, at others a lively surprise, unmingled with disbelief, was painted on his countenance. When I had concluded my narration, I said, This is the being whom I accuse and for whose seizure and punishment I call upon you to exert your whole power. It is your duty as magistrate, and I believe and hope that your feelings as a man will not revolt from the execution of those functions on this occasion. The address caused a considerable change in the physiognomy of my own auditor. He had heard my story with that kind, half kind of belief that is given to a tale of spirits and supernatural events, but when he was called upon to act officially in consequence, the whole tide of his incredulity returned. He, however, answered mildly, I would willingly afford you every aid in your pursuit, but the creature of whom you speak appears to have powers which would put all my exertions to defiance. Who can follow an animal which can traverse the sea of ice, and inhabit caves and dens where no man would venture to intrude? Besides, some months have elapsed, elapsed, elapsed since the commission of his crimes, 
and no one can conjecture to what place he has wandered, or what region he may now inhabit. I do not doubt that he hovers near the spot which I inhabit, and if he has indeed taken refuge in the Alps, he may be hunted like the chamois, and destroyed as a beast of prey. But I perceive your thoughts, you do not credit my narrative, and do not intend to pursue my enemy with the punishment which is his desert. As I spoke, rage sparkled in my eyes. The magistrate was intimidated. You are mistaken, said he. I will exert myself, and if it is in my power to seize the monster, be assured that he shall suffer punishment proportionate to his crimes. But I fear from what you have, you have yourself described to be his properties that this will prove impracticable, and thus, while every proper measure is pursued, you should make up your mind to disappointment. That cannot be. But all that I can say will be of little avail. My revenge is of no moment to you. Yet while I allow it to be a vice, I confess that it is dev the devouring and only passion of my soul. My rage is unspeakable. When I reflect that the murderer, whom I have turned loose upon society, still exists, you refuse my just demand. I have but one resource, and I devote myself, either in my life or death, to his destruction. I trembled with excess of agitation as I said this. There was a frenzy in my manner, and something, I doubt not, of that haughty fierceness which the martyrs of old are said to have possessed. But to a German magistrate, whose mind was occupied by far other ideas than those of devotion and heroism, this elevation of mine had much the appearance of madness. He endeavored to soothe me as a nurse as a child, and reverted to my tale as the effects of delirium. Man, I cried, how ignorant art thou in thy pride of wisdom! Cease! You know not what it is you say. I broke from the house angry and disturbed, and retired to the meditate. I broke from the house angry and disturbed, and retired to meditate on some other mode of action. End of chapter 23 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, see LibriVox.blogsome.com Dot com. Today's reading by Hugh McGuire. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Chapter 24. My present situation was one in which all voluntary thought was swallowed up and lost. I was hurried away by fury. Revenge alone endowed me with strength and composure. It molded my feelings, and allowed me to be calculating and calm, at periods when otherwise delirium or death would have been my portion. My first resolution was to quit Geneva forever. My country, which, when I was happy and beloved, was dear to me, now in my adversity became hateful. I provided myself with a sum of money, together with a few jewels which had belonged to my mother, and departed. And now my wanderings began, which are to cease but with life. I have traveled a vast portion of the earth, and have endured all the hardships which travelers in deserts and barbarous countries are wont to meet. How I have lived I hardly know. How many times I stretched my failing limbs upon the sandy plain, and prayed for death. But revenge kept me alive. I dare not die and leave my adversary in being. When I quitted Geneva, my first labor was to gain some clue by which I might trace the steps of my fiendish enemy. But my plan was unsettled, and I wandered many hours round the confines of the town uncertain what path I should pursue. 
As night approached, I found myself at the entrance of the cemetery where William, Elizabeth, and my father reposed. I entered it and approached the tomb which marked their graves. Everything was silent, except the leaves of the trees which were gently agitated by the wind. The night was nearly dark, and the scene would have been solemn and affecting even to an uninterested observer. The spirits of the departed seemed to flit around and to cast shadow, which was felt but not seen, around the head of the mourner. The deep grief which this scene had at first excited quickly gave way to rage and despair. They were dead, and I lived. Their murderer also lived, and to destroy him I must drag out my weary existence. I knelt on the grass and kissed the earth, and with quivering lips exclaimed, By the sacred earth on which I kneel, by the shades that wander near me, by the deep and eternal grief that I feel, I swear, and by thee, O night, and the spirits that preside over thee, to pursue the demon who caused this misery, until he or I shall perish in mortal conflict. For this purpose I will preserve my life. To execute this dear revenge will I again behold the sun and tread the green herbage of earth, which otherwise should vanish from my eyes forever. And I call on you, spirits of the dead, and on you, wandering ministers of vengeance, to aid and conduct me in my work. Let the cursed and hellish monster drip, drink deep of agony. Let him feel the despair that now torments me. I had begun my adjuration with solemnity, and an awe which almost assured me that the shades of my murdered friends heard and approved my devotion. But the furies possessed me as I concluded, and rage choked my utterance. I was answered through the stillness of the night by a loud and fiendish laugh. It rang on my ears long and heavily. The mountains re-echoed it, and I felt as if all hell surrounded me with mockery and laughter. Surely in that moment I should have been possessed by frenzy, and have destroyed my miserable existence, but that my vow was heard, and that I was reserved for vengeance. The laughter died away, when a well-known and abhorred voice, apparently close to my ear, addressed me in an audible whisper. I am satisfied, miserable wretch. You have determined to live, and I am satisfied. I darted towards the spot from which the sound proceeded, but the devil eluded my grasp. Suddenly the broad disk of the moon arose and shone full upon his ghastly and distorted shape as he fled with more than mortal speed. I pursued him, and for many months this has been my task. Guided by a slight clue, I followed the windings of the Rhone, but vainly. The blue Mediterranean appeared, and by a strange chance I saw the fiend enter by night, and hide himself in a vessel band bound for the Black Sea. I took my passage in the shame, same ship, but he escaped, I know not how. Amidst the wilds of Tartary and Russia, although he still evaded me, I have ever followed in his track. Sometimes the peasants, scared by this horrid apparition, inform me of his path, Sometimes he himself, who feared that if I lost all trace of him, I should despair and die, left some mark to guide me. The snows descended on my head, and I saw the print of his huge step on the white plain. To you first entering on life, to whom care is new and agony unknown, how can you understand what I have felt and still feel? Cold, want, and fa fatigue were the least pains of which I was destined to endure. I was cursed by some devil, and carried about with me my eternal hell. Yet still a spirit of good followed and directed my step, and when I most murmured, would suddenly extricate me from seemingly insurmountable difficulties. 
Sometimes, when nature, overcome by hunger, sunk under the exhaustion, a repast was prepared for me in the desert that restored and inspirited me. The fare was indeed coarse, such as the peasants of the country ate, but I will not doubt that it had it was set there by the spirits that I had invoked to aid me. Often, when all was dry, the heavens cloudless, and I was parched by thirst, a slight cloud would bedim the sky and shed a few drops that revived me and vanish. I followed, when I could, the courses of the rivers, but the demon generally avoided these, as it was here that the population of the country chiefly collected. In other places human beings were seldom seen, and I generally subsisted on the wild animals that crossed my path. I had money with me, and gained the friendship of the, of the villagers by distributing it, while I brought with me some food that I had killed, which, after taking small part, I always presented to those who had provided me with fire and utensils for cooking. My life, as it passed thus, was indeed hateful to me, and it was during sleep alone that I could taste joy. Oh, blessed sleep! Often when most miserable I sank to repose, and my dreams lulled me even to rapture. The spirits that guarded me had provided these moments, or rather hours, of happiness that I might retain strength to fulfill my pilgrimage. Deprived of this respite, I should have sunk under my hardships. During the day I was sustained and inspirited by the hope of night for in sleep I saw my friends, my wife, and my beloved country. Again I saw the benevolent countenance of my father, heard the silver tones of my Elizabeth's voice, and beheld Clerville, enjoying health and youth. Often, when wearied by a toilsome march, I persuaded myself that I was dreaming until night should come, and that I should then enjoy reality in the arms of my dearest friends. What agonizing fondness did I feel for them? How did I cling to their fears, to their... What agonizing fondness did I feel for them? How did I cling to their dream forms, as sometimes they haunted even my waking hours, and persuade myself that they still lived? At such moments vengeance that burned within me died in my heart, and I pursued my path towards the destruction of the demon, more as a task enjoined by heaven, as the mechanical impulse of some power of which I was unconscious, than as the ardent desire of my soul. What his feelings were whom I pursued I cannot know. Sometimes, indeed, he left marks in writing on the bark of the trees, or cut in stone, that guided me, and instigated my fury. My reign is not yet over. These words were legible in one of these inscriptions. You live, and my power is complete. Follow me. I seek the everlasting ices of the north, where you will feel the misery of cold and frost to which I am impassive. You will find near this place, if you follow not too tardily, a dead hare. Eat and be refreshed. Come on, my enemy. We have yet to wrestle for our lives, but many hard and miserable hours must you endure until that period shall arrive. Scoffing devil, again do I vow vengeance, again do I devote thee miserable fiend to torture and death. Never will I give up my search until he or I perish, and then with what ecstasy shall I join my Elizabeth and my departed friends, who even now prepare for me the reward of my tedious toil and horrible pilgrimage. As I still pursued my journey to the northward, the snows thickened, and the cold increased in a degree almost too severe to support. The peasants were shut up in their hovels, and only a few of the most hardy ventured forth to seize the animals whom starvation had forced from their hiding places to seek for prey. The rivers were covered with ice, 
and no fish could be procured. And thus I was cut off from my chief article of maintenance. The triumph of my enemy increased with the difficulty of my labors. One inscription that he left was in these words, Prepare, your toil is only begin. Wrap yourself in furs, and provide food, for we shall soon enter upon a journey where your sufferings will satisfy my everlasting hatred. My courage and perseverance were invigorated by these scoffing words. I resolved not to fail in my purpose, and calling on heaven to support me, I continued with unabated fervor to traverse immense deserts until the ocean appeared at a distance and formed the utmost boundary of the horizon. Oh, how unlike it was to the blue seasons of the south! Covered with ice, it was only to be distinguished from land by its superior wildness and ruggedness. The Greeks wept for joy when they beheld the Mediterranean from the hills of Asia, and hailed with rapture the boundary of their toils. I did not weep, but I knelt down, and with a full heart thanked my guiding spirits for conducting me in safety to the place where I hoped, notwithstanding my adversary's jibe, to meet and grapple with him. Some weeks before this period I had procured a sled and dogs, and thus traversed the snows with inconceivable speed. I know not whether the fiend possessed the same advantages, but I found that, as before, I had daily lost ground in the pursuit I now gained on him, so much so that when I first saw the ocean he was but one day's journey in advance, and I hoped to intercept him before he should reach the beach. With new courage, therefore, I pressed on, and in two days arrived at a wretched hamlet on the seashore. I inquired of the inhabitants concerning the fiend and gained accurate information. A gigantic monster, they said, had arrived the night before, armed with a gun and many pistols, putting to flight the inhabitants of a solitary cottage through fear of his terrific appearance. He had carried off their store of winter food and, placing it in a sledge to draw which he had seized on a numerous drove of trained dogs. He had harnessed them, and the same night, to the joy of the horror-struck villagers, had pursued his journey across the sea in a direction that led to no land, and they conjectured that he must speedily be destroyed by the breaking of the ice, frozen by the eternal frosts. On hearing this information I suffered a temporary access of despair. He had escaped me, and I must commence a destructive and almost endless journey across the mountainous ices of the ocean, amidst cold that few of the inhabitants could long endure, and which I, the native of a genial and sunny climate, could not hope to survive. Yet at the idea that the fiend should live and be triumphant, my rage and vengeance returned, and like a mighty tide, overwhelmed every other feeling. After a slight repose, during which the spirits of the dead hovered round and instigated me to toil and revenge, I prepared for my journey. I exchanged my land sledge for one fashioned for the inequalities of the frozen ocean, and purchasing a plentiful stock of provisions, I departed from land. I cannot guess how many days have passed since then, but I have endured misery which nothing but the eternal sentiment of a just retribution burning within my heart could have enabled me to support. Immense and rugged mountains of ice often barred up my passage, and I often heard the thunder of the ground sea which threatened my destruction. But again the frost came and made the paths of the sea secure. By the quantity of provision which I had consumed, I should guess that I had passed three weeks in this journey, and the continual protra protraction of hope, returning back upon the heart, 
often wrung bitter drops of despondency and grief from my eyes. Despair had indeed almost secured her prey, and I should soon have sunk beneath this misery. Once after the poor animals that conveyed me had with incredible toil gained the summit of a sloping ice mountain, and one, sinking under his fatigue, died, I viewed the expanse before me with anguish, when suddenly my eye caught a dark speck upon the dusky plain. I strained my sight to discover what it could be, and uttered a wild cry of ecstasy when I distinguished a sledge and the distorted proportions of a well-known form within. Oh, with what burning gush did hope revisit my heart! Warm tears filled my eyes, which I hastily wiped away that they might not intercept the view I had of the demon. But still my sight was dimmed by the burning drops until, given, giving way to the emotions that oppressed me, I wept aloud. But this was not the time for delay. I disencumbered the dogs of their dead companion, gave them a plentiful portion of food, and after an hour's rest, which was absolutely necessary, and yet which was bitterly irksome to me, I continued my route. The sledge was still visible, nor did I again lose sight of it, except at the moment when for a short time some ice rock concealed it with its intervening crags. I indeed perceptibly gained on it, and when, after nearly two days' journey, I beheld my enemy at no more than a mile distance, distant, my heart bounded within me. But now, when I appeared almost within grasp of my foe, my hopes were suddenly extinguished, and I lost all trace of him more utterly than I had ever done before. A ground sea was heard, the thunder of its progress as the waters rolled and swelled beneath me became every moment more ominous and terrific. I pressed on, but in vain. The wind rose and the sea roared, and, as with the mighty shock of an earthquake, it split and cracked with a tremendous and overwhelming sound. The work was soon finished. In a few minutes a tumultuous sea rolled between me and my enemy, and I was left drifting on a scattered piece of ice that was continually lessening, and thus preparing for me a hideous death. In this manner many and appalling hours passed. Several of my dogs died and I myself was about to sink under the accumulation of distress when I saw your vessel riding at anchor, and holding forth to me hopes of su succor and life. I had no conception that vessels ever came so far north, and was astounded at the sight. I quickly destroyed part of my sledge to construct oars, and by these means was enabled, with infinite fatigue, to move my ice raft in the direction of your ship. I had determined if you were going southward, still to trust myself to the mercy of the seas rather than abandon my purpose. I hoped to induce you to grant me a boat with which I could pursue my enemy. But your direction was northward. You took me on board when my vigor was exhausted, and I should soon have sunk under my multiplied hardships into a death which I still dread, for my task is unfulfilled. Oh, when will my guiding spirit in conducting me to the demon allow me the rest I so much desire? Or must I die, and he yet live? If I do, swear to me, Walton, that he shall not escape, that you will seek him and satisfy my vengeance in his death. And do I dare to ask of you to undertake my pilgrimage to endure the hardships that I have undergone? No. I am not so selfish. Yet when I am dead, if he should appear, if the ministers of vengeance should conduct him to you, swear that he shall not live, swear that he shall not triumph over my accumulated woes and survive to add to the list of his dark crimes. He is eloquent and persuasive, and once his words had even power over my heart, but trust him not. His soul is as hellish as his form, full of treachery and fiend-like malice. Hear him not. Call
call on him the manes of William, Justine, Clerval, Elizabeth, my father, and the wretched Victor, and thrust your sword into his heart. I will hover near and direct the steel aright. Walton, in continuation, August 26th, 17 something. You have read this strange and terrific story, Margaret, and do you not feel your blood congeal with horror like that which even now curdles mine? Sometimes, seized with sudden agony, he could not continue his tale. At others, his voice broken, yet piercing, uttered with difficulty the words so replete with anguish. His fine and lovely eyes were now lighted up with indignation, now subdued to downcast sorrow, and quenched in infinite wretchedness. Sometimes he commanded his countenance and tones, and related the most horrible incidents with a tranquil voice, suppressing every mark of agitation. Then, like a volcano bursting forth, his face would suddenly change to an expression of the wildest rage, as he shrieked out imprecations on his persecutor. His tale is connected and told with an appearance of the simplest truth. Yet I own to you that the letters of Felix and Safi, which he showed me, and the apparition of the monster seen from our ship, brought to me a greater conviction of the truth of his narrative than his assertiveness, however earnest and connected. Such a monster has, then, real existence. I cannot doubt it. Yet I am lost in surprise and admiration. Sometimes I endeavored to gain from Frankenstein the particulars of his creature's formation, but on this point he was impenetrable. Are you mad, my friend, said he, or whither does your senseless curiosity lead you? Would you also create for yourself and the world a demonical enemy? Peace, peace. Learn my miseries and do not seek to increase your own. Frankenstein discovered that I made notes concerning his history. He asked to see them, and then himself corrected and augmented them in many places, but principally in giving me the life and spirit to the conversations he held with his enemy. Since you have preserved my narration, said he, I would not that a mutilated one should go down to posterity. Thus has a week passed away while I have listened to the strangest tale that ever imagination formed. My thoughts and every feeling of my soul have been drunk up by the interest of my guest, which this tale and his own elevated and gentle manners have created. I wish to soothe him, yet I can counsel one so indefinitely miserable, so destitute of every hope and consolation. Frankenstein discovered that I made notes concerning his history. He asked to see them, and then himself corrected and augmented them in many places, but principally giving the life and spirit to the conversations he held with his enemy. Since you have preserved my narration, said he, I would not that a mutilated one should go down to posterity. Thus has a week passed away while I have listened to the strangest tale that ever imagination formed. My thoughts and every feeling of my soul have been drunk up by the interest for my guest, which this tale and his own elevated gentle manners have created. I wish to soothe him, yet can I counsel one so infinitely miserable, so destitute of every hope of consolation to live? Oh no, the only joy that he can now know will be when he composes his shattered spirit to peace and death. Yet he enjoys one comfort, the offspring of solitude and delirium. delirium. He believes that when in dreams he holds converse with his friends and derives from that communion consolation for his miseries or excitements to his vengeance, that they are not the creations of his fancy, but the beings themselves who visit from the regions of a remote world. This face, faith gives a solemnity to his reveries that render them to me almost as imposing and interesting as truth. 
Our conversations are not always confined to his own history and misfortunes. On every point of general literature he displays unbounded knowledge and a quick and piercing apprehension. His eloquence is forcible and touching. Nor can I hear him when he relates a pathetic incident or endeavors to move the passions of pity or love without tears. What a glorious creature must he have been in the days of his prosperity when he is thus noble and godlike in ruin. He seems to feel his own worth and the greatness of his fall. When younger, said he, I believe myself destined for some great enterprise. My feelings are profound, but I possessed a coolness of judgment that fitted me for illustrious achievements. This sentiment of worth of my nature supported me when others would have been oppressed for I deemed it criminal to throw away in useless grief those talents that might be useful to my fellow creatures. When I reflected on the work I had completed no less than one, no less a one than the creation of a sensitive and rational animal, I could not rank myself with the herd of common projectors. But this thought, which supported me in my commencement of my career, now serves only to plunge me lower in the dust. All my speculations and hopes are as nothing, and, like the archangel who, inspired, who aspired to omnipotence, I am chained to an eternal hell. My imagination was vivid, yet my powers of analysis and application were intense. By the union of these qualities I conceived the idea and executed the creation of a man. Even now I cannot recollect without passion my reveries while the work was incomplete. I trod heaven in my thoughts, now exulting in my powers, now burning with the idea of their effects. From my infancy I was imbued with high hopes and lofty ambition. But how I am sunk! Oh, my friend, if you had known me as I once was, you would not recognize me in this state of degradation. Despondency rarely visited my heart. A high destiny seemed to bear me on until I fell, never, never again to rise. Must I then lose this admirable being? I have longed for a friend. I have sought one who would sympathize with and love me. Behold, on these desert seas I have found such a one. But I have fear I have gamed him only to know his value and lose him. I would reconcile him to life, but he repulses the idea. I thank you, Walton, he said, for your kind intentions towards so miserable a wretch. But when you speak of new tides and fresh affections, think you that any can replace those who are gone? Can any man be to me as Clerval was, or any woman another Elizabeth? Even where the affections are not strongly moved by any superior excellence, the companions of our childhood always possess a certain power over our minds, which hardly any later friend can obtain. They know our infinite dispositions, which, however they may be afterwards modified, are never eradicated. They can judge of our actions with more certain conclusions as to the integrity of our motives. A sister or a brother can never, unless indeed such symptoms have been shown early, suspect the other of fraud or false dealings, when another friend, however strongly he may be attached, may, in spite of himself, be contemplated with suspicion. But I enjoyed friends, dear not only through habit and association, but from their own merits, and wherever I am, the soothing voice of my Elizabeth, and the conversations of Clerval will ever be whispered in my ear. They are dead, but one feeling in such a solitude can persuade me to preserve my life. If I were engaged in any high undertaking or design, fraught with extensive utility to my fellow creatures, then I could live to fulfill it, but such is not my destiny. I must pursue and destroy the being to whom I have gave existence. Then my lot on earth 
will be fulfilled and I may die. September 2nd. My beloved sister, I write to you, encompassed by peril, and ignorant whether I am ever doomed to see again dear England, and the dearer friends that inhabit it. I am surrounded by mountains of ice which admit of no escape, and threaten every moment to crush my vessel. The brave fellows who I am persuaded to be my companions look towards me for aid, but I have none to bestow. There is something terribly appalling in our situation, yet my courage and hopes do not desert me. Yet it is terrible to reflect that the lives of all these men are endangered through me. If we are lost, my mad, mad schemes are the cause. And what, Margaret, will be the state of your mind? You will not hear of my destruction, and you will anxiously await my return. Years will pass, and you will have visiting of despair, and yet be tortured by hope. Oh, my beloved sister, the sickening failing of your heartfelt expectations is, in prospect, more terrible to me than my own death. But you have a husband and lovely children. You may be happy. Heaven bless you and make you so. My unfortunate guest regards me with the tenderest compassion. He endeavors to fill me with hope and talks as if life were a possession which he valued. He reminds me how often the same accidents have happened to other navigators who have attempted this sea and in spite of myself he fills me with cheerful auguries. Even the sailors feel the power of his eloquence. When he speaks they no longer despair. He rouses their energies, and while they hear his voice they believe, the last, they believe these vast mountains of ice are molehills, which will vanish before the resolutions of man. These feelings are transitory. Each day of expectation delayed fills them with fear and I almost dread a mutiny caused by this despair. September 5th. A scene has just passed of such uncommon interest that although it is high, highly probable that these papers may never reach you, yet I cannot forbear recording it. We are still surrounded by mountains of ice, still in imminent danger of being crushed in their conflict. The cold is excessive and many of my unfortunate comrades have already found a grave amidst this scene of desolation. Frankenstein has daily declined in health. A feverish fire still glimmers in his eyes, but he is exhausted, and when suddenly roused to any exertion, he speedily sinks again into apparent lifelessness. I mentioned in my last letter the fears I entertained of a mutiny. This morning, as I sat, watching the wan countenance of my friend, his eyes half closed and his limbs hanging listlessly, I was roused by half a dozen of the sailors who demanded admission into the cabin. They entered, and their leader addressed me. He told me that he and his companions had been chosen by the other sailors to come in deputation to me, to make a requisition, which, in justice, I could not refuse. We were immured in ice, and should probably never escape, but they feared that if, as was possible, the ice should dissipate and a free passage be opened, I should be rash enough to continue my voyage, and lead them into fresh dangers, after which they might happily have surmounted this. They insisted, therefore, that I should engage with a solemn promise that if the vessel should be freed, I would instantly direct my course southward. Their speech troubled me. I had not despaired, nor had I yet conceived the idea of returning if set free, yet I could in justice. Yet could I, in justice, or even in possibility, refuse this demand? I hesitated before I answered. When Frankenstein, who had at first been silent, and indeed appeared hardly to have force enough to attend, now roused himself, his eyes sparkled and his cheeks flushed with momentary vigor. Turning towards the men, he said, What do you mean? What do you ma demand of your captain? Are you then so easily turned from your design? Did you not call this a glorious expedition? And wherefore was it glorious? Not because the way was smooth and placid as a southern sea, but because it was full of dangers and terror, because at every new incident your fortitude was to be called forth, and your courage exhibited, because danger and death surrounded it, and these you were to brave and overcome. For this it was glorious, and for this it was an honorable undertaking, 
you were hereafter to be hailed as the benefactors of your species, your names adored as belonging to the brave men who encountered death for honor and the benefit of mankind. And now, behold, with the first imagination of danger, or, if you will, the first mighty and terrific trial of your courage, you shrink away and are content to be handed down as men who had not strength enough to endure cold and peril. And so poor souls were chilly and returned to their warm firesides. Why, that requires not this preparation. Ye need not have come thus far and dragged your captain to the shame of a defeat merely to prove yourself cowards. Oh, be men, or be more than men. Be steady to your purposes and firm as a rock. This ice is not made of such stuff as your hearts may be. It is mutable and cannot withstand you. If you say that it shall not, do not return to your families with the stigma of disgrace marked on your brows. Return as heroes who have fought and conquered, and who know not what it is to turn back, turn their backs on the foe. He spoke this with a voice so modulated to the different feelings expressed in his speech, with an eye so full of lofty design and heroism that can you wonder that these men were moved? They looked at one another and were unable to re reply. I spoke. I told them to retire and consider of what had been said, that I would not lead them farther north if they strenuously desired the contrary, but that I hoped that, with reflection, their courage would return. They retired, and I turned towards my friend, but he was sunk in languor, languor and almost deprived of life. How all this will terminate I know not, but I had rather die than return shamefully, my purpose unfulfilled. Yet I fear such will be my fate. The men, unsupported by ideas of glory and honor, can never willingly continue to endure their present hardship. September 7th. The die is cast. I have consented to return if we are not destroyed. Thus are my hopes blasted by cowardice and indecision. I come back ignorant and disappointed. It requires more philo philosophy than I possess to bear this injustice with patience. September 12th. It is past. I am returning to England. I have lost my hopes of utility and glory. I have lost my friend. But I will endeavor, endeavor to detail these bitter circumstances to you, my dear sister. And while I am wafted towards England and towards you, I will not despond. September 9th, the ice began to move, and roarings like thunder were heard at a distance. As the island split and cracked in every direction, we were in the most imminent peril, but as we could only remain passive, my chief attention was occupied by my unfortunate guest, whose illness increased by, in such a degree that he was entirely confined to his bed. The ice cracked behind us and was driven with force towards the north. A breeze sprung from the west, and on the eleventh the passage towards the south become, became perfectly free. When the sailors saw this, and that their return to the native country was apparently assured, a shout of tumultuous joy broke from them, loud and long continued. Frankenstein, who was dozing, awoke and asked the cause of the tumult. They shout, I said, because they will soon return to England. Do you then really return? Alas, yes, I cannot withstand their demands. I cannot lead them unwillingly to danger. I must return. Do so if you will, but I will not. You may give up your purpose, but mine is assigned to me by heaven, and I dare not. I am weak. But surely the spirits who assist my vengeance will endow me with sufficient strength. Saying this, he endeavored to spring from the bed, but the exertion was too great for him. He fell back and fainted. It was not long before he was restored, and I often thought that life was ex entirely extinct. At length he opened his, his eyes. He breathed with difficulty and was unable to speak. The surgeon gave him a composing draught and ordered us to leave him undisturbed. In the meantime, he told me that my friend had certainly not many hours to live. 
His sentence was pronounced, and I could only grieve and be patient. I sat by his bed watching him. His eyes were closed, and I thought he slept. But presently he called to me in a feeble voice, and bidding me come near, said, Alas, the strength I re relied on is gone. I feel that I soon shall die, and he, my enemy and persecutor, may still be in being. Think not, Walton, that in the last moments of my existence I feel that burned hatred and ardent desire of revenge I once expressed, but I feel myself justified in desiring the death of my adversary. During these last days I have been occupied in examining my past conduct, nor do I find it blamable. In a fit of enthusiastic madness I created a rational creature and was bound towards him to assure, as far as was in my power, his happiness and well-being. This was my duty. But there was another, still power paramount to that. My duties towards the beings of my own species had greater claims to my attention, because they included a greater proportion of happiness or misery. Urged by this view, I refused and did right in refusing to create a companion for the first creature. He showed unparalleled malignity and selfishness in evil. He destroyed my friends. He devoted to destruction beings who possessed exquisite sensations, happiness, and wisdom. Nor do I know where this thirst for vengeance may end. Miserable himself, that he may render no other wretched he ought to die. The task of this destruction was mine, but I have failed. When actuated by selfish and vicious motives, I asked you to undertake my unfinished work, and I renew this request now, when I am only induced by reason and virtue. Yet I cannot ask you to renounce your country and friends, to fulfill this task. And now that you are returning to England, you will have little chance of meeting with him. But the consideration of these points, and the well-balancing of what you may esteem your duties, I leave to you. My judgment and ideas are already disturbed by the near approach of death. I dare not ask you to do what I think right for I may still be misled by passion. That he should live to be an instrument of mischief disturbs me. In other respects, this hour, when I momentarily expect my release, is the only happy one which I have enjoyed for several years. The forms of the beloved dead flit before me, and I hasten to their arms. Farewell, Walton. Seek happiness in the tranquility, and avoid ambition even if it be only the apparently innocent one of distinguishing yourself in science and discoveries. Yet why do I say this? I have myself been blasted in these hopes. Yet another may succeed. His voice became faint as he spoke, and at length, exhausted by his effort, he sunk into silence. About half an hour afterwards he attempted again to speak, but was unable. He pressed my hand feebly, and his eyes closed forever, while the irradiation of a gentle smile passed away from his lips. Margaret, what comment can I make on the untimely extinction of this glorious spirit? What can I say that will enable you to understand the depth of my sorrow? All that I should express would be inadequate and feeble. My tears flow. My mind is overshadowed by a cold, a cloud of disappointment. But I journey towards England and I may there find consolation. I am interrupted. What do these sounds portend? It is midnight, the breeze blows fairly, and the watch on deck scarcely stir. Again, there is a sound as of a human voice, but hoarser. It comes from the cabin where the remains of Frankenstein still lie. I must arise and examine. Good night, my sister. Great God, what a scene has just taken place! I am yet dizzy with remembrance of it. I hardly know whether I shall have the power to detail it, yet the tale which I have recorded would be incomplete without this final and wonderful catastrophe. I entered the cabin where lay the remains of my ill-fated and admirable friend. 
Over him hung a form which I cannot find words to describe, gigantic in stature, yet uncouth and distorted in its proportions. As he hung over the coffin, his face was concealed by long locks of ragged hair, but one vast hand was extended in color and apparent texture like that of a mummy. When he heard the sound of my approach, he ceased to utter exclamations of grief and horror and sprung towards the window. Never before did I behold a vision so horrible as his face, of such loathsome yet appalling hideousness. I shut my eyes involuntarily and endeavored to recollect what were my duties with regard to this destroyer. I called on him to stay. He paused, looking on me with wonder, and again turning towards the lifeless form of his creator, he seemed to forget my presence, and every feature and gesture seemed instigated by the wildest rage of some, some uncontrollable passion. That is also my victim, he explained, exclaimed. In his murder my crimes are consummated. The miserable series of my being is wound to its close. That is also my victim, he exclaimed. In his murder my crimes are consummated. The miserable series of my being is wound to its close. Oh, Frankenstein, generous and self-devoted being, what does it avail that I now ask thee to pardon me? I who irretrievably destroyed thee by destroying all thou lovest. Alas, he is cold. He cannot answer me. His voice seemed suffocated, and my first impulses, which had suggested to me the duty of obeying the dying request of my friend in destroying his enemy, were now suspended by a mixture of curiosity and compassion. I approached this tremendous being. I dared not again raise my eyes to his face. There was something so scarring and unearthly in its ugliness. I attempted to speak, but the words died away on my lips. The monster continued to utter wild and incoherent self-reproaches. At length I gathered resolution to address him in a pause of the tempest of his passion. Your repentance, I said, is now superfluous. If you had listened to the voice of conscience and heeded the strings of remorse, before you had urged your diabolical vengeance to this extremity, Frankenstein would yet have lived. And do you dream, said the demon? Do you think that I was then dead to agony and remorse? He, he continued pointing to the corpse, he suffered not in the consummation of the deed. Oh not the ten-thousandth portion of the anguish that was mine during the lingering detail of its execution. A frightful selfishness hurried me on, while my heart was poisoned with remorse. Think you that the groans of Clerval were music to my ears? My heart was fashioned to be susceptible of love and sympathy. And when wretched by the misery of vice and hatred, it did not endure the violence of the char change, without torture such as you cannot even imagine. After the murder of Clerval, I returned to Switzerland, heartbroken and overcome. I pitied Frankenstein. My pity amounted to horror. I abhorred myself. But when I discovered that he, the author at once of my existence and of its unspeakable torments dared to hope for happiness, that while he accumulated wretchedness and despair upon me, he sought his own enjoyment in feelings and passions from the indulgence of which I was forever barred, then impotent envy and bitter indignation filled me with an insatiable thirst for vengeance. I recollected my threat and resolved that it should be accomplished. I knew that I was preparing myself for a deadly torture, but I was the slave, not the master, of an impulse which I detested, yet I could not disobey. Yes, when she died, nay, then I was not miserable. 
I had cast off all feeling, subdued all anguish, to riot in the excess of my despair. Evil thenceforth became my good. Urged thus far, I had no choice but to adapt my nature to an element which I had willingly chosen. The completion of my demonical design became an insatiable passion, and now it is ended. There is my last victim. I was at first touched by the expression of his misery, yet when I called to mind what Frankenstein had said of his powers of eloquence and persuasion, and when I again cast my eyes on the lifeless form of my friend, indignation was rekindled within me. Wretch, I said, it is well that you come here to whine over the desolation that you have made. You throw a torch into a pile of buildings, and when they are consumed you sit among the ruins and lament the fall. Hypocritical fiend, if he whom you mourn still lived, still would he be the object, again would he become the prey of your acu accursed vengeance. It is not pity that you feel. You meant lament only because the victim of your malignity is withdrawn from your power. Oh, it is not thus, not thus, interrupted the being. Yet such must be the impression conveyed to you by what appears to be the purport of my actions. Yet I seek not a fellow feeling in my misery. No sympathy may I ever find. When I first sought it, it was the love of virtue, the feelings of happiness and affection, with which my whole being overflowed that I wished to be participated. But now that virtue has become to me a shadow and that happiness and affection are turned into bitter and loathing despair, in what should I seek for sympathy? I am content to suffer alone, while my suffering shall endure. When I die, I am well satisfied that abhorrence and opprobrium should load my memory. Once my fancy was soothed with dreams of virtue, of fame, and of enjoyment. Once I falsely hoped to meet with beings who, pardoning my outward form, would love me for the excellent qualities which I was capable of unfolding. I was nourished with high thoughts of honor and devotion. But now crime has degraded me beneath the meanest animal. No guilt, no mischief, no malignity, no misery can be found comparable to mine. When I run over the frightful catalogue of my sins, I cannot believe that I am the same creature whose thoughts were once filled with sublime and transcendent visions of the beauty and the majesty of goodness. But it is even so. The fallen angel becomes a malignant devil. Yet even that enemy of God and man had friends and associates in his desolation. I am alone. You who call Frankenstein your friend seem to have a knowledge of my crimes and his misfortunes, but in the detail which he gave you of them he could not sum up the hours and month of, months of misery which I endured wasting in impotent passions. For while I destroyed his hopes, I did not satisfy my own desires. They were forever ardent and craving. Still, I desired love and fellowship, and I was still spurned. Was there no injustice in this? Am I to be thought the only criminal, when all humankind sinned against me? Why do you not hate Felix, who drove his friend from the door with contumely? Why do you not execrate the rustic who sought to destroy the savior of his child? Nay. These are virtuous and immaculate beings. I, the miserable and the abandoned, am an abortion to be spurned at, kicked, and trampled on. Even now my blood boils at the recollection of this injustice. But it is true that I am a wretch. I have murdered the lovely and the helpless. I have strangled the innocent as they slept and grasped to death his throat who never injured me or any other living thing. I have devoted my creator 
the select specimen of all that is worthy of love and admiration among men to misery. I have pursued him even to that irredeemable ruin. There he lies, white and cold in death. You hate me, but your abhorrence cannot equal that with which I regard myself. I look on the hands which, which executed the deed, I think of the heart, in which the imagination of it was conceived, and long for the moment when these hands will meet my eyes, when that imagination will haunt my thoughts no more. Fear not that I shall be instrument of future mischief. My work is nearly complete. Neither yours nor any man's death is needed to consummate the series of my being and accomplish that which must be done, but it requires my own. Do not think that I shall be slow to perform this sacrifice. I shall quit your vessel on the ice raft which brought me thither, and shall seek the most northern extremity of the globe. I shall collect my funeral pile, and consume to ashes this miserable frame that it remains its remains may afford no light to any curious and unhallowed wretch who would create such another as I have been. I shall die. I shall no longer feel the agonies which now consume me, or be the prey of feelings unsatisfied yet unquenched. He is dead who, could, who called me into being, and when I shall be no more, the very remembrance of us both will speedily vanish. I shall no longer see the sun or stars, or feel the winds play on my cheeks. Light, feeling, and sense will pass away, and in this condition must I find my happiness. Some years ago, when the images which this world affords first opened upon me, when I felt the cheering warmth of summer and heard the rustling of the leaves and the warbling of the birds, and these were all to me, I should have wept to die. Now it is my only consolation, polluted by crimes and torn by the bitterest remorse. Where can I find rest but in death? Farewell. I leave you and in the last of the humankind, whom these eyes will ever behold. Farewell, Frankenstein. If thou wert yet alive and yet cherished a desire of revenge against me, it would be better satiated in my life than in my destruction. But it was not so. Thou didst not seek my extinction, that I might not cause greater wretchedness. And if yet, in some mode unknown to me, thou hadst not ceased to think and feel, thou wouldst not desire against me a vengeance greater than that which I feel. Blasted as thou wert, my agony was still superior to thine, for the bitter sting of remorse will not cease to rankle in my wounds until death shall I close them forever. But soon, he cried with sad and solemn enthusiasm, I shall die, and what I now feel be no longer felt. Soon these burning miseries will be extinct. I shall ascend my funeral pile triumphantly, and exult in the agony of the torturing flames. The light of that conflagration will fade away. My ashes will be swept into the sea by the winds. My spirit will sleep in peace, or if it thinks, it will not surely think thus. Farewell. He sprung from the cabin window, as he said this, upon the ice raft which lay close to the vessel. He was soon borne away by the waves, and lost in darkness and distance. The End <laughs>